when the rain creeps into the south. Just a few showers. Cold across northern Scotland. Temperatures not much above freezing, but very mild further south. Double digits, if not into the teens. But feeling cold under this rain band. It is mostly rain, and it will be rain as it hits the central belt of Scotland this evening. But to the north of the central belt, over the hills, we will start to see some snow falling overnight. The rain clearing from northern England, northern Ireland for a time, but some showers will drift in through the night. It's going to be blustery. streets, windy today. It stays fairly gusty overnight. That'll all add up to a fairly mild night. Temperatures staying at 7 or 8 Celsius across the south. Still some touches of frost in northern Scotland. Still the colder air here, so still some snow falling, especially on the higher routes for a time on Christmas Eve morning. Uh, for many, it's a bright and breezy kind of day. There will be some showers, mostly in the west, but a good part of the Midlands, eastern England, staying dry and fine through Christmas Eve. And it will be mild, double digits almost across the board. Still fairly cold, though, across much of Scotland, especially where the rain and hill snow persists. More showers coming in during Christmas Eve evening, so it could be quite lively out there. Some heavy bands of showers moving through on gusty, gusty winds, and that's how we go into Christmas Day. Christmas Day looking drier for many. Some rain in the southeast, wet in the yet northwest, and then it turns colder for all of us on Boxing Day. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Co. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Well, a very good afternoon, everybody. You're with me, Patrick Christie's right here on GB News. Now, everyone is winding down for Christmas, but we're not, because there's a giant stocking full of news out there, and we're going to do the absolute lot of it. 
Border Force officers have taken the day off. Some people might be wondering where they've been. Year after year after year of record numbers, people crossing the channel. We've got an exclusive on the knock-on effects of the Border Force strikes and a mass shooting in Paris leaves at least three dead. The suspect reportedly was known to authorities for previously attacking migrants a year ago. We'll have the latest on that. I have the tireless campaigner for women's rights, the wonderful Kelly J. Keane, to react to the news that women's rights actually took a battering in Scotland yesterday. Male rapists will now be allowed into female spaces should Westminster block the gender recognition bill despite the constitutional consequences of it. Nurses are threatening more strike action as well. Classic. Get the emails coming in, people. I want to hear from you mainly on two topics today. Let's narrow it down a bit. Should Westminster overrule Scotland on the gender bill madness? And something a little bit lighter. Get these in my inbox as well. Cheer us all up, OK? What is the worst Christmas present you've ever sent anyone? Not received, the worst one you've ever sent anyone. A lot of people doing last-ditch shopping today. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Get them flying in. But now, it's your headlines. Good afternoon. It's coming up to two minutes past three. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Three people have been killed and several others wounded after a gunman opened fire at a Kurdish cultural centre in central Paris. It's been confirmed those who died were from the Kurdish community. Live images show locals gathering outside the centre this afternoon to pay their respects. A 69-year-old suspect has been detained by police in connection with the attack. According to French media, the suspect was known to police and allegedly attacked a migrant camp last year. The health secretary has called the latest strikes by nurses on January the 18th and 19th disappointing and says they're in no one's best interests. The Royal College of Nursing says the walkouts will go ahead unless the government opens negotiations over pay. Meanwhile, the GMB's called off a post-Christmas strike by ambulance workers in England and Wales. They'll now strike on January the 11th. The union's national secretary, Rachel Harrison, thanked the public for their support. The public are deeply worried about our NHS, and we are too. People across the country have been incredible in backing our members and NHS workers, and we care so much about them. That's why we are suspending the proposed GMB industrial action on the 28th of December. We know the public will appreciate being able to enjoy Christmas without any additional anxiety. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has apologised for Christmas travel disruption following strike action by Border Force staff today. What do we want? Ten percent. When do we want it? No. Heathrow, Gatwick, Birmingham, Cardiff, Glasgow and Manchester airports are all affected. However, Heathrow does claim it's operating as normal. Military personnel and volunteers from the civil service have been trained to step in. Rishi Sunak insists public sector pay must be controlled to keep down inflation. First of all, I'm, I'm really sad and I'm disappointed about the disruption that is being caused to so many people's lives, particularly at Christmas time. What I'm trying to do is make the right long-term decisions for the country, for everybody's benefit. And I think we all know that the, the major economic challenge we all face now is inflation. It's inflation that's eating into everyone's pay packets, it's you know, rising the cost of living. And I want to make sure that we reduce inflation. Part of that is being responsible when it comes to setting public sector pay. GB News understands airlines face millions of pounds in extra fuel costs as they deal with likely long delays during the border force strike. British Airways is one of a number of airlines instructing its pilots to take on additional fuel to help cope with holding in the skies for an extra hour. A senior aviation source said the contingency plan was essential but extremely costly. The Prime Minister says it's completely reasonable for the UK government to consider blocking new gender legislation in Scotland. Rishi Sunak's comments come after MSPs voted yesterday to pass the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. It lowers the age when people can apply to change their legal gender to 16 and removes the need for a medical diagnosis. Holyrood has warned any attempted intervention from the UK government will be vigorously contested. 
A powerful Arctic storm is sweeping across large parts of the US and Canada with temperatures plunging to as low as minus 45 degrees. Experts are warning exposure to bare skin could lead to frostbite within minutes. More than 100 million people are under weekend weather alerts uh, ahead of the busiest travel days of the year. The storm's forecast to develop into what's being described as a bomb cyclone, bringing with it heavy, blinding snow. Well, that is back here. Motorists are being warned to expect long delays as millions hit the road to spend Christmas with friends and family. The AA says today will be the busiest day of the festive period, with an estimated 16.9 million journeys being made across the UK. A strike tomorrow by thousands of RMT members working at Network Rail is expected to make matters worse. The walkout will last until December the 27th. The Princess of Wales has paid tribute to the late Queen Elizabeth in a special broadcast set to air on Christmas Eve tomorrow. A warning the following contains flashing images. Catherine introduces the Royal Carol Service, the first since the Queen died in September. It was held at Westminster Abbey and attended by other members of the royal family, including the King and Queen Consort. This year, we've invited hundreds of inspiring individuals to the service those who showcase the power of connectedness and community values, allowing us to continue Her Majesty's tradition of recognising and thanking those who have gone above and beyond to support others. Her Majesty leaves with us an incredible legacy and one that has deeply inspired many of us. And George Cohen, part of England's 1966 World Cup winning team, has died aged 83. Cohen played every minute of the victorious campaign on home soil and in total won 37 caps for his country. His former club, Fulham, announced his death this morning. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Patrick. Hello, wonderful people. It's Patrick Christie's here on GB News, and we've got loads for you today. Don't worry, I will be trying to keep it a little bit lighter towards the end of this hour. As I ask you to tell me the worst Christmas presents you've ever sent anyone, I've already asked you the worst ones you've received. This time, I want to know what a terrible son, grandson, daughter, wife, husband you are, basically. Get the fun coming in. GB Views at GBNews.uk. I've got some classics in there myself. Anyway, right, no prizes if you guessed today's top story, though. It's more strikes. This time it's Border Force staff walking out, causing disruption at airports across the UK. I know a lot of people are already emailing in saying, where have they been with the record numbers in the channel? But yes, we'll get stuck into that. Members of the PCS union have included as well staff at Passport Controls are beginning eight days of industrial action. It's part of a dispute over pay, pensions and job security. <laughs> Employees have walked out at Heathrow, Gatwick, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff and Glasgow airports. They're also striking at the ports of New Haven. Earlier, the UK Border Force Chief Operating Officer Steve Dan said that he didn't think there'd be significant delays because of the strike. Well, we've done a lot of work to try and reduce that, minimise any delays at all, working with the operators, as you're probably aware. Uh, that's the airlines, the airports. Uh, we've had lots of meetings with those and we're very, very grateful for the support they've had. The other thing we've done is, is brought in extra resources. So we've got significant numbers of uh, military personnel here helping us out, volunteers from across government departments, as well as border force officers who have come into the workplace. With all that, we don't think there will be significant delays. We're doing everything we can to minimise any disruption. My job is to manage pressures, uh, is to move resources, is to identify where the, uh, the threats and risks are. Uh, we are about border security, let's be very clear, and border security will not be compromised in what we're doing. And so I'm making sure that we have the right resources, the right trained resources in the right place to keep the UK's border safe and to ensure a smooth flow of uh, passengers through the border. Well, lots to talk about when it comes to the border strikes, but also on those strikes, GB News has been told that airlines are facing millions of pounds in extra fuel costs over these strike days. That's because jets may have to circle for longer in the sky because of airport delays. Joining me now in the studio is our home and security editor, Mark White. Uh, Mark... Let's start with the border force strikes then initially. So what's actually happening and is it actually going to impact people generally? I mean, fuel on planes, Mark, you're going to have to sell it to me. Well, it's very important because at the end of the day, you, when you want to go on your next flight off to some holiday resort in the tropics, are going to be paying 
extra for your ticket because uh -huh. of the fuel that they're now having to uh, put on the, the flight for the potential of circling round in the hold as they're coming into hub areas like London. Anybody flying into London anyway will be aware that quite often for many minutes you're circling round waiting for your landing slot. Now we've seen an internal email from British Airways instructing its pilots to put an additional hour's worth of fuel. Now that equates, if you take a flight from uh, New York across the Atlantic mm. to London, depending on the, the, the type of aircraft, but it's roughly about £27,000 to fuel that aircraft yeah. for the trip. If you're putting an extra hour's fuel on, it's about six and a half thousand additional wow. pounds required. Then multiply that over many, many thousands of arrival flights into these affected UK airports during the time of the strike. You can see it's many, many millions of pounds mm -hmm. that airlines that have been absolutely hammered by COVID, uh, the pandemic months and years mm. as it stretched on, were very destructive for the airline industry with many thousands of jobs uh, that were lost within that sector. They're rebuilding slowly but surely. The people are coming back mm. and now they're being hit by this. Well, this is it. I mean, the strikes right across the country in all different sectors. Public health has been affected. Transport has been affected. National security potentially being affected by this. And now, crucially as well, because aeroplanes are pumping themselves full of even more fuel. The environment. I mean, maybe this is how we get these strikes stopped when Greta Thunberg pipes up and goes, hang on a minute, have you seen the desecration we're doing to the ice caps here? You've got to get back to work. But on that national security element, Mark, I'm concerned, I'm sure a lot of people are, when they hear the word border force, they think of the channel, they think of terror threats, they think of whatever. And if they're not there, to me, that screams danger. Yeah, and we've got the chief operating officer from Border Force that you heard or saw in that clip as well, saying that, you know, they're managing and they have the resources on passport control. But the fact is, those men and women of the military and other agencies who've been brought in to help are not fully trained professional border staff whose job it is to look out for mm. people that might just not be right, that, you know, that give off some tell signs, as far as they're concerned, that say to them, this requires a bit more of an investigation as to who this person is, where they've come from, and what potential threat they might uh, cause. So mm. when you're asking a member of the military to step in and do that, yeah, they can open up a passport yeah. and look and see that your face matches the passport they've been given. But you don't necessarily have that years of experience that a Border Force agent would have no. to do that same job. No, absolutely. I won't ask you why, in your opinion, I keep getting stopped at border checks. So I think we'll leave that for a show later on. Because you're a happy-go-lucky face and they just want to chat to you. Well, that's what it is. Sometimes they want to get very personal with me. But when it comes to the military stepping in, obviously yet another incident that the military are having to fill the gap for. Just having just the Border Force, what do they want? It's just all about pay, is it? Yeah, the pain conditions, that, uh, as so many of these strikes right. are at the moment. I mean, Border Force say that, actually, it's going very smoothly. Um, many people have said it's going more smoothly than it would on a normal day when Border Force are there and manning the passport controls. But that shouldn't be surprising because lots of people have probably made alternative flight plans, uh, fearing that there would be significant disruption. Mm. They've also, uh, the authorities... Uh, poured extra resources into these passport controls with the military and the like to ensure it goes as smoothly as possible. We've eight days of this. Let's see how it goes on day two or three or yeah. four. Um, I wouldn't quite put the, the sort of no. the bunting up yet to celebrate how smoothly things have gone. No, and of course, as well, if it is going smoothly, it would imply maybe people are being waved through, although I'm sure they're not. Now, I am being told furiously that I have a border force clip to play, so let's do it. What it could lead to is, is flight delays and flight bunching. But again, this is what we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We manage the business as usual, changes in, in approach, flight bunching, uh, and we have the resources and the contingent resource able to respond to that. Yes, you too might recognise that clip from just a couple of minutes ago, but there we go. We well, can't he was, get enough he was Mr. talking Dan. there actually <laughs> just about, you know, the, the potential effects on the ground, Patrick, if you've got all of the huge passport queues, because what you would get are the airlines saying to the individual 
uh, or the, the airports saying to the individual airlines, keep keep your, your passengers on the plane at the flight gate. Uh, don't disembark them at the moment. And then, of course, there's nowhere for the arriving aircraft to go. They're all sort of racked and stacked. And that's what he was alluding to there. OK. Uh, now, obviously, the border force strikes are very serious for anyone who's travelling in this country or looking into this country or, and all of that stuff. But there is another very, very serious incident that, as we understand, is potentially still unfolding in one way or the other in Paris. And, Mark, I'll throw this one over to you. There has been a shooting in Paris. Yeah, and as we speak, uh, I think we're hearing from the French interior uh, minister who's giving an update on this. But the latest we have is that three people have died, another four people have been injured too critically, uh, as, say, the Interior Minister might have uh, more up-to-date information uh, on that casualty yeah. list. A 69-year-old man is in custody. He is the suspected shooter. This incident happened in the 10th arrondissement in central Paris, not far from the Gare du Nord railway station, mm. uh, for those that know Paris. Uh, and it was a Kurdish cultural centre that seems to be in the epicentre for this shooting attack. You can see the emergency services there. A huge response for, from them. Uh, Paris, no stranger to terrorist attacks in recent years. And, of course, when these attacks happen, the first thing that most people will think about is Islamist terrorist attacks. That is by far the predominant threat that is facing Paris, London and many other European cities. Mm. On in, in this particular occasion, though, it seems that it may have been uh, a right, far-right motivated attack. Again, we'll wait to hear the information, but the suspect, okay. we're told, is someone who was recently released from prison uh, and had been arrested and charged okay. uh, in connection with a racist attack on a migrant camp in Paris about a year ago. OK, Mark, look, thank you very much for that. You will, of course, be keeping us up to date throughout the course of the day on those border force strikes and on that incident in Paris. Mark White, their home and security editor. Now, by the way, just a little bit of a tease of something I've got coming up shortly is we have the wonderful Kelly J. Keane, who we will all know, we will all know as the fearless, tireless campaigner for women's rights. She is going to be reacting, one would imagine, rather furiously to what's been going on north of the border in Scotland where, basically, women's rights essentially have been massively eroded by this gender recognition bill, which would see, potentially anyway, male, very much male, rapists allowed into women's spaces. This was waved through last night. Huge controversy, huge reaction. We'll get all of that very, very shortly. Keep your views coming in on it, though, because I think it's, well, frankly, kicked rice off, hasn't it? GBviews at gbnews.uk. But with rail strikes and clogged airports, the UK's roads are said to be chock-a-block. As commuters rush home for Christmas, the AAs issued an amber traffic warning for today and Christmas Eve, warning drivers of long delays across the country. GB News' very own Theo Tricomba has the latest advice on how to make driving home for Christmas as smooth as possible. Someone should write a song about that. It's two days until Christmas Day and millions of people are expected to be travelling across the UK. The motor and company AA estimate there'll be around 16.9 million people on the roads today. Meanwhile, the RAC say do travel after 7 p.m. this evening as if you travel before, you're likely to come across traffic and, of course, come across those who are commuting from work this evening. If you're travelling in London, Transport for London, TfL, are saying travel only if necessary. But if you do need to travel, do expect delays. And also for those who are travelling by air, going to airports today, Border Force workers will be striking today. And if you are travelling by boats from New Haven in the south of England. Do expect delays there as well as Border Force staff work in that area. And of course, the next few days, we're going to have RMT union strikes uh, from tomorrow until Monday the 26th. So travel will be resuming properly for people who need to get on the train on Tuesday at around 7 a.m. So it's set to be a busy Christmas period for those of you who are traveling. And the advice is to check before you travel and plan your journey in advance. Well, there we go. That's the edge of Comba there. I do regret to inform people that the Edgware Road looks like that every single day. But yes, high traffic, high traffic, everybody. Anyway, you are with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. The Scottish Parliament signed a controversial gender recognition bill into law yesterday. It's made it easier for children as young as 16 to change gender without seeing a doctor. 
But there's also the prospect that it could be repealed by the UK government, and this is where it does get even more fascinating than it already is, because actually it could create some kind of constitutional crisis. Do you think that Westminster should overrule this Scottish gender madness? I'm going to be joined by the wonderful Kelly J. Keane on that. A lady not known for mincing her words, and I suspect that today of all days she's not going to hold back. Make sure you tune in for that. I'll have the latest very, very shortly. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I went to bed genuinely angry last night. It was because of something that happened up in Scotland yesterday. I'm sure you're all aware of the utter madness that took place there. Well, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has said it would be reasonable for the UK government to consider blocking new gender reforms in Scotland. The past week seen intense debate at Holyrood. That's over the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, which has remarkably been passed. It's intended to make it easier for trans Scots to obtain a gender recognition certificate, which all sounds relatively well-meaning, although that in itself is controversial. However, there are a load of knock-on effects to this. The irreversible damage to children and, of course, women's safety. Westminster could effectively veto Sturgeon's legislation if it's believed to have an adverse effect on laws the UK Parliament has jurisdiction over. Joining me now, and I'm going to get straight to her because I think we've all heard enough of me on this issue, is a woman's rights campaigner and founder of Standing for Women. It's Kelly J. Keane. Kelly, how did you feel yesterday at the video that emerged of a group of elected politicians standing up and applauding a group of men who'd pushed for a bill to erode women's rights? 
Oh, it was quite grotesque, wasn't it? Uh, how I felt, I don't know. It was between being utterly bereft and completely enraged. <laughs> so it was, it was like a trans hybrid feeling. I like it, right? Okay, all right. What, in your view, will this bill lead to? Oh, gosh, the consequences are so enormous from... I mean, Scotland's already been pretty poor when it comes to women's spaces anyway, um, which is why J.K. Rowling recently opened um, a domestic violence rape crisis type centre just for women, because there aren't any uh, in certain areas of Scotland. In fact, there aren't too many in, in England or Wales either, because everyone's far too frightened to exclude men from those spaces. So you have uh, domestic violence shelters, you have every single space women have carved out for ourselves is now completely vanished, evaporated, because men can just identify uh, their way into them. And then as far as children go, I think this, this might be a first step uh, for Scotland, to be quite honest. I mean, Spain's just done it so you can uh, legally change your sex marker um, at the age of 12, as long as you have uh, some sort of corrupt judge to agree with you. So we really are in um, end of days kind of territory. It's really scary. The response from quite a lot of people to this is, well, look, it's only a small number of people that would conceivably abuse this law to find themselves as male rapists in a woman's space. What do you say to that? Well, there's 35 million men in the UK and only 12,000 of them are serving time for rape. So it's only ever a small number of men that raping women, but it only takes one. You only need one man to do it uh, for it to be catastrophic for women. Um, and the fear that we feel about going into spaces now, certainly in Scotland, I mean, where can women actually feel safe at all in that entire country? Why have they done this? I don't know what their motivations are. I really can't see past uh, not caring about women, um, not caring about the safety of women, not caring about the dignity of women, not seeing women as fully human, um, a, a mediocre power grab. I mean, it can also be like the first, uh, apparently the first debate back after uh, Christmas is going to be Scottish independence. Maybe this is some sort of dodgy little um, backroom deal. I, I have no idea. Nothing good. There is not one good reason I think that they could possibly be doing this. Not one. It's not just the SNP. Labour, they whipped their politicians to wave this through. The Greens and the Lib Dems as well. Have they all been mm. captured by what is becoming an increasingly fashionable trans ideology? I think so. I mean, look, right across this country, there are women still too frightened to speak, even though they've now just watched an entire country lose women's rights. And there's still women too scared to speak up. Uh, these politicians are too scared to speak up. They're too frightened of not being elected, which is why the House of Lords has been absolutely um, a godsend in these times. Uh, but as for Labour, I mean, what are they doing? Are they just hoping that the whole of Twitter might vote for them? Because it's not going to be people that are worried about the cost of living crisis this year. It's not going to, they're not going to win back mm. uh, Labour voters with these idiotic policies. Should Westminster overrule this? Oh, yeah, that would just be so beautiful. What a lovely Christmas miracle if they could if they could just overrule it. I think it will have consequences. Can, for example, my 16-year-old daughter, can she just pop north of the border, uh, become a boy and then come back to England and then everybody has to treat her as a, a boy? So, yes, I think the ramifications are huge. I think we have no choice but to block it. Can I ask you something and hear me out a bit on this? But one of the positives, if not the only positive, that I could try to muster out of this last night as I was on my way home was that maybe now this really crystallises it for people. Uh, Kelly, OK, all right, sorry, stay, please stay where you are, Kelly. I'm just getting something in my ear, I'm afraid. Sorry about this. Uh, I'm going to be told that I've got to go live to Paris where three people have been killed in a shooting at a Kurdish community centre. It looks like members of the Kurdish community have gathered there and are clashing with police. I think we've got some footage of this. This is live from Paris right now. So earlier on in the day, a 69-year-old man reportedly, allegedly shot dead three people in the 10th arrondissement of Paris. Supposedly four other people are injured too critically. 
It's understood that it was either at or near a Kurdish community centre and the individual who is believed to have carried out this attack is a 69-year-old man who was reportedly known to police for attacking a group of migrants in a tent, or in tents, I should say, last year. What you are watching now, if you're watching us on television, if you're listening on radio, you can hear what appears to be smoke billowing out of the street. It may well end up being tear gas. We're not 100% sure at the minute, but the fact is that what we can see is clashes, or protests anyway, involving French police and as we understand this at the moment anyway, members of the Kurdish community who have gathered in response to this earlier attack. We're going to keep these on the screen now, these images, because these are live images from Paris and it does look like it's getting increasingly agitated. Mark White, our home and security editor, has just joined me in the studio now. Mark. Yeah, well, people there are clearly very suspicious of the authorities in Paris, they believe that uh, this is not being properly investigated. We're seeing these clashes erupting uh, now in the streets. Uh, that looks, from what I can see, to be tear gas further down the street. Uh, that won't have come from the protesters. That will have come from the French riot police, the CRS. Now, this uh, location that you're looking at is the 10th arrondissement which is in central Paris, not far from the Gardenor railway station in Paris. Damn, I mean, uh, you know, Paris is a huge multicultural city. There's a big Kurdish community in Paris. They feel that they have been under attack, they say, from the far right. Um, um, the far right, of course, in France, increasingly uh, vocal in their opposition to the growing number of migrants in that country and the problems that they see uh, mass migration having uh, in France itself. So there are, you know, just as there are in this country, you know, increasing tensions, well, those tensions are much more significant and being felt on a daily basis uh, in cities like Paris, in Marseille particularly as well, uh, which is a very ethnically diverse city, as so many of France's big... I'm just uh, having a look at what we can see on the screen there, Mark, and... Oh, it's a hammer and sickle on one of the... It's a hammer and sickle on one of them. They're partisan is another flag. These are the, the demonstrators, I suppose you could call them at this stage anyway, who appears to be waving these in, and massing on the streets, chanting taking place and well it's yeah and the camera's panning round now and we can see I mean it's hard to estimate but it does appear to be it's definitely in the hundreds of people gathering there around the 10th arrondissement a lot of them Mark with phones in their hands recording the whole thing yeah I mean a lot as always happens in these occasions a lot of the people that are there will probably be people people that are gathering and uh, you know curious and nosy and want to see what's going on but there will, of course, as there often is, be those who are more intent on actually confrontation uh, with the authorities. Um, now, I should say that we've had, in the last few minutes, Patrick, an update from mm. the French Interior Minister, who is in that area himself, and was speaking to the cameras. He said that the, uh, the suspected killer uh, is a 69-year-old French national who understands the former train driver. He was unknown to the security services, uh, according to the interior minister. Uh, unclear, he said, if the attack that happened this morning had political motivations. Um, this 69-year-old had a criminal record, uh, but not for extremism, according to the interior minister. Uh, and he was not known to be a member yeah. of a right-wing group. So and you can see from the pictures there, actually, the um, various missiles that are now being thrown towards the French riot priest. These are the CRS, the equivalent of our TSG, Territorial Support Group, uh, in the Metropolitan Police. They are trained to deal with public order situations. And, of course, uh, with... France in particular, uh, when they have 
uh, disputes and strikes, they often turn uh, quite violent in a way that they don't uh, do as much here in this country. But clearly, the live pictures there. They're barricading themselves onto the streets, aren't they? There now yeah. they've got those riot shields in front of them. Oh, well, and they're charging, aren't they? At, at protesters now, it would appear that. Yeah. So I mean, that's uh, again a tactic as the police want to. Uh, push forward to confront the protesters that are throwing these missiles. They are firing uh, their, their CS spray, their, their gas, I should say, their tear gas uh, towards the protesters that are there. Uh, now, this is the other side of wow. that. This so is live footage got, from both sides, isn't we've it? We've got two live shots that uh, the uh, news agencies are providing for us here. It's that same. Uh, scene that you're looking at, but uh, this scene you're looking at it from the vantage point of the protesters. Back this way now, it just changed, is the other camera angle uh, showing you the, adva the vantage point of the police. Now, to me, there are very few there are. police resources there actually. Uh, they will, as we speak, be um. getting resources into the area, because what they weren't the police expecting... officers injured there as well. What we can see there is a chap clutching his head. He looks yeah. to be in quite a lot of discomfort. Well, because it's happened so sporadically, uh, so spontaneously, I should say, and so quickly, they've not had a chance to fully gear up uh, to the public order protection with the helmets and all of the padding that they require. So they've managed to get their shields out of the vans to give themselves some initial protection from all the missiles. A real that are volley of over. missiles, Mark, isn't yeah. it? A huge volley of missiles incoming. And the police officers, as well, it's worth noting, do not appear to be wearing helmets whatsoever. So they have shields, as Mark was saying as well. You can see there's probably, uh, it's hard to say, maybe 20 police officers, maybe 20. We have the camera shot from the other side of what's taking place there at the moment. And hundreds, absolutely hundreds of people have been gathered. On the other side, the police significantly outnumbered, Mark, and this, to be honest with you, has the potential, one would imagine, to get very ugly very quickly. Yes, I mean, what we had this morning was a security situation and the potential uh, for this having been declared a terrorist attack. It was a, a mass shooting, three people killed, another four at least injured, some seriously. It's developed on from the security situation uh, with the possibility of further attacks to actually very angry crowds reacting to what happened this morning and demanding whatever they're demanding, we don't know. But the police now, having adopted initially that security uh, posture, are now having to adopt a public order and posture. What we can see at the moment, and I'm just going to describe this for radio listeners, are a group of people masked with hoods up, throwing anything they get their hands on as the police yet again charge at this crowd, trying to disperse it. A camera man there right in the middle of this. And we're on the other side of it now, and we're on the other side, so we're on the side where one would imagine it's a lot of protesters who are clearly angry at the fact that earlier on today, three people died, four people injured, two critically, after a 69-year-old man, known to authorities as we understand it, opened fire at a Kurdish community centre. You can see that protesters now are covering their noses and their mouths and their eyes are streaming because of the tear gas that the police have deployed. Yet again, just want to emphasise the sheer numbers here in Paris at the moment. There is several hundred, easily several hundred, people from, I don't want to call it the Kurdish side because we don't know that exactly yet, but from that element of proceedings, massively outnumbering the police who are essentially trying to cattle them in, I suppose you could say, Mark. Yes, I mean, what will be uh, the, the tactic of the police uh, in a, a public order situation like this is to try to contain this issue. They don't want it spreading out into other se uh, sectors of the city. So you've got these relatively narrow-looking streets in the 10th arrondissement in central Paris. Uh, you've got a crowd of several hundred people there not that many police at the moment, but le reinforcements will be on their way to that central Paris location. Uh, and they will hem them in, they will try to push forward and to deal yeah. with those at the front. But you can see they're throwing well, there's projectiles you know, bricks and, and everything. Well, ripping anything off that they can find. I mean, I've seen a couple of traffic signs go flying, ladders, you would imagine shop, bits of shop front as well, constantly 
being thrown in a series of volleys over to where the police are. Mark, the police are in France anyway. Well, now, in fact, the shot that we've got there is a group of French police officers desperately trying to cover their heads because they do not appear to have any protective gear when it comes to the helmets, just a couple of them. Again, they're just not cowering, of course, hiding, really, taking cover is a better way of saying it, behind riot shields, a few more arriving there. Now, Mark, in terms of the French police, they are, of course, used to terror attacks. They are used to civil disorder as the police charge again to try to push back this crowd, tear gas in the air, thick with it. And the French police don't tend to mess about in situations like this, Mark, which could make things a bit more volatile, maybe? No, I think that's fair to say that they uh, tend to have a more robust uh, response to their policing than, say, the police here in the UK. Uh, but the police here in the UK, uh, you know, they will ratchet up uh, their, their response given the, uh, the violence that they face. Uh, in Paris, we often see it, you know, the, the police uh, can wade in really quite quickly with tear gas and, uh, and pushing forward. But it's very obvious to see, and we're describing this, of course, for radio listeners as well, from the pictures that we're seeing, the police officers, the majority of them that are there, are not wearing full protective gear. Uh, and that's because they probably are not the CRS public order trained officers. Uh, they are more likely those officers that were there as part of the security operation responding to the attack this morning and then just having a sort of uh, security and a reassurance presence in that area for the local population. Well, now it's turned violent. Yeah. They have to very quickly, some of them, because just like in this country, the vans will have uh, riot shields. And you can see some of the officers, because they're not uh, public order officers, it seems they are themselves uh, suffering the effects of the tear gas that some of their number have set off towards the protesters. Mm. Uh, normally, they would be wearing the gas mask to protect themselves. And that's because so it's happened so quickly, so isn't it? As I say, yeah. the fans will have shields and maybe helmets. It's a matter of getting to them, getting the shields out, getting the helmets out, uh, and potentially the gas mask. Some of them have been able to kit up to a degree. But as more specialist teams come in that are public order trained, they will be in their full kit. Uh, and better able to deal with the violence that they are clearly meet, um, uh, meeting there. Yeah, they are. And look, given the context of what's taking place, just earlier on, ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, three people were shot dead, four injured, two believed to be critically injured after a 69-year-old man who was known to police, as we understand it anyway, was known to police for previously uh, violent offence involving migrants in tents earlier on, about a year ago. That particular gentleman, as we understand, if you can call him a gentleman, I suppose, uh, is in police custody. Um, and it's worth noting in this context, Mark, that that took place at a Kurdish community centre or nearby a Kurdish community centre. Clearly, I mean, just visibly, what we can see here right now is the fact that most of the people in that crowd who are involved in this protest, riot, demonstration, whatever you want to call it, really, it's turning violent, uh, would, it would appear, be reasonable to suspect they are from that community. And, Mark, Paris, and indeed France in general, really, but Paris does have a little bit of a check in history when it comes to race relations. It's a very diverse city, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, Fra France in general is a very diverse country. And there are increasing tensions in this country, uh, you know, with uh, ethnic uh, minorities and, and those communities and with everything that's happening in the channel with small boats. But actually, you know, take that up a few yeah. notches when you're in France. Yeah. Uh, they have some very significant problems uh, with uh, certain groups, particularly down in Marseille, but also uh, in Paris as well. Uh, and as you can see the cameraman doing their best yeah. to try to continue to feed us some live shots there. But it's very dangerous for them because they're coming under attack from missiles. There's the tear gas that's being fired uh, on occasion. Members of the there. public urging the rioters to stop as well. And we have got a camera on both sides of this now. So we're getting footage 
goodness me, as we've seen chairs flying and bits of shops being ripped off, and there's no sign of this stopping. Projectiles being lobbed at police left, right and centre as the police try to hit back with tear gas. There's a police van, I believe it is, there that we can see that is being absolutely pelted at the moment with various different projectiles as the police try to move through this. It's an incredibly chaotic situation. There's rocks being thrown, everything being thrown now at that police van. And the police significantly outnumbered and not with, it would appear at the moment anyway, a huge amount of project protective gear. Tear gas again being thrown in. There is no sign of this stopping anytime soon, Mark. No, well, this was so spontaneous uh, that they didn't, they weren't geared up for a riot. They were geared up uh, as normal police officers to offer reassurance after a terrible, deadly attack. Uh, but the anger of that crowd has spilt over now into violence. Now, what uh, viewers and uh, for those radio listeners uh, are seeing and what they're hearing uh, is tear gas. We were just seeing uh, the, the restaurants there, uh, groups of angry looking young men picking up chairs and tables from the restaurant, trying to smash them, uh, clearly, with a view to lobbing them over towards the police at one point. You were describing one of the vans that appeared to be stuck up the side street yeah. there. That happens. I mean, this clearly a, a, a warren of kind of narrow streets there. Just behind that van were a group of about half a dozen police officers with shields. As the van moved, they were exposed a bit and came under attack. They were indeed, and if you're just joining us, this is Paris now, live images, live images from a riot taking place in the 10th arrondissement of Paris. This follows an incident involving three people being shot dead. As it currently stands anyway, we'll get you the latest on this if this changes. Four people injured, two people critically after a 69-year-old man opened fire at a Kurdish community centre. It would appear now anyway that members of the Kurdish community or people in that area. It's reasonable to suggest that anyway, given what we can see taking place in front of us now and the flags that are being waved, have taken to the streets in protest at that. They are throwing projectiles and massing, ripping bits off shops. And I can see one chap who looks to be, it would appear anyway, stood on a bus stop, brandishing a piece of wood rather aggressively. Police officers grouping and trying to regroup we can see police, we have seen police anyway, with various different injuries. And uh, let's just turn the volume up now and people can listen to what we can see. <laughs> the noise there of the crowd. <laughs> Out of the way. I mean, this is very worrying, Patrick, because you can clearly see from the images that. Uh, we're providing you in these live uh, camera shots from Paris. There are agitators in there that are trying to egg on other people. The pe police pushing forward there and uh, just back. momentarily and then being pushed back by the crowd as those agitators are pushing back towards the police. There is real potential for people to be very seriously injured here. This is going to get incredibly nasty, ladies and gentlemen. The police, it would appear from the angles that we can see anyway, have almost been hemmed into a street, tunnelled in, really. It doesn't appear there's a huge amount of space for them to go as these protesters are massing in front of them. It is violent, it is aggressive, and it's difficult to see how this stops. As there's a chap there with a chair again, throwing it around the place. Lots of men there, pretty much all men from what we can see. Masked, hats on, hoods up, balaclavas, and... This is clearly taking place across rather a large section. And there appears to be a fire breaking out now, further down the street. There is definitely a fire. Something has been set on fire in the middle of that street. And I think what we can see from that camera angle is almost like the border between the police and these protesters. It looks as though it's to the side of a vehicle, it may be the vehicle itself. Um, or it could be, you know, they've got these big bins in the yeah. streets as well that are much easier to set fire to. But the real concern here is that you see a situation similar uh, to the situation we had uh, in Tottenham uh, in 2011, I think it was after the death of Mark Duggan, where you have angry scenes that spill over into violence. 
and then real violence because Absolutely. what you get is buildings and vehicles set on fire. Now, if that's what we're descending into here, then it is very, very worrying, clearly, for French authorities and for people in that community. Remember, that this, we think, is a predominantly Kurdish community. Uh, it's their shops and businesses, at the end of the day, that are going to be targeted by, you know, many people perhaps from their own community. But the, the fact is, and understandably, there's a great deal of anger in this community this morning after this uh, shooting that resulted in the deaths of three people and more than four others injured, two of them critically. And it doesn't take much to spark a violent response. You just need a few agitators and we can see well, it's from the shots that there are plenty of people taking up that particular uh, duty of trying to uh, push people on. And what we can see now, we described to you a little bit earlier on about a fire that has just erupted in the middle of the street and from the images that we're getting anyway, it appears like a cluster of bins, debris realistically, that's been, been thrown at police previously, has been ripped off shop fronts and that is now in the middle of the road and it is on fire which creates a permanent barrier, a permanent blockage anyway, between the police. The police had been trying to push these people back. More and more things are being thrown onto this fire now. And it, in fact, it's turned into a full-scale barricade. I can see mesh there, I can see bins, I can see all sorts of stuff that is being lit, flags being waved. This crowd certainly not getting any smaller, that's for sure. Not getting any quieter. You can hear the whistles, the screams and the chants in the background there. And just to give you a scale of how quickly this has escalated, we were reporting probably around 15 minutes ago that the latest on this was that a 69-year-old man had been arrested after three people had been shot dead, four injured, two critically, in a Kurdish community centre in the 10th arrondissement of Paris. That man, previously known to police for offences against migrants, and then quick as a flash after that, we started getting it through to us here that this had turned nasty, and it had turned into, well, turned even nasty. Of course, it was already nasty. I mean, it was a terrible attack, but now it's turned into riots, and we're getting angles, had previously been getting angles, I must say, from both sides of this. So we had it from the police's side, so behind the police as they massed, and then from the protesters' side, from what we can gather now, anyway, we appear to have it pretty much from the protesters' side, but two different camera angles, which implies that the boundaries have moved somewhat. People rubbing their eyes, people streaming with tears, and that tears coming from the tear gas market. You mentioned earlier that the police were so significantly outnumbered that they were going to have to regroup, they were going to have to get reinforcements. That appears to be happening. I have not seen a police officer for a little while now because they're clearly holding a line further down the line. And instead, what this has made possible is for a big fire to erupt in the middle of the street and hordes of people. Now, actually, we can see the protesters, the rioters, coming forward even beyond that line, throwing projectiles as they go, Mark. Yeah, it's, it's those agitators, again, at the front that are trying to uh, cajole and uh, signal others within the main group and body uh, to push further down towards the police. This is very dangerous for those camera crews that are out there as well from the news agencies, Reuters, Associated Press and others uh, who are providing these live pictures. Um, you know, sometimes you're in the middle of this, these public order situations and that crowd, they might ignore you and then the next second they can turn on you. So, you know, some pretty brave work by the camera crews that are able to offer us some live footage. Now, what I haven't seen, what we haven't been able to see, mm. um, just by virtue of the fact that the camera doesn't appear to be near any of the police lines, is what activity is going on with the police at the moment. Uh, they will be uh, expanding their numbers. It will take officers additional time because they will be in all parts of Paris. Uh, to get to that location. Then they've got to decide exactly where they are, where they're going, what they're doing. Shopkeepers, they're desperately trying to get all of their stock inside, trying to make sure that none of it can, well, be damaged, I suppose, or taken and used as projectiles. What we're seeing now is, because this is in the 10th arrondissement in Paris, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, so it's full of shopping districts. It's a large Kurdish community area, and it is believed to be uh, in the Amet Kaya Kurdish Centre. So it's the Amet Kaya Kurdish Centre in the 10th arrondissement in Paris. 
and what we're seeing there is shopkeepers, people who previously, just a matter of hours ago, might would have been going about their normal lives, going about a normal day, a couple of days before Christmas. We can see various different Christmas decorations in some parts of the, of the, of the area there. French flags, uh, rather ironically at this particular moment in time, flying other flags as well. We're trying to decipher exactly what they are, the hammer and the sickle on one of them. And now, just this has descended into chaos. It's fair to say, Mark, that a full-scale violent riot is currently taking place on the streets of Paris. Yeah, we'll have to see how it develops, but uh, certainly, you know, people gesticulating uh, victory signs in the air, they clearly feel that they have the streets, or at least this particular street. I think, in reality, all it means is that the police have pull pulled back a bit uh, to an area not immediately near those protesters. They may think they have the streets at the moment, but that could change in an instant if police get sufficient numbers to push forward. Because, as I say, you know, the French police, the, uh, the riot police, uh, the CRS in particular, are, you know, pretty robust in the tactics they use to gain control of a situation. Yeah, and the police did have a presence. Again, it's important to emphasise how quickly this all kicked off. So the police had a presence there. They had a presence namely because they were already present as a result of the fact that there'd been a shooting earlier on there. But when these people gathered, it all happened so quickly. What we were witnessing was police officers along a road being... Well, having projectiles hurled at them, tear gas, and the police went away and regrouped. And what we're just seeing now, for the first time in a while, actually, to the right of people's shocks, if you're watching on television, are the police having regrouped and a complete volley of tear gas. More police running in. Now, it appears to me, Mark, as though the, what they're carrying there is... You would know better than I do. They're wearing helmets now, which they were not before, and that's important. So they're charging towards where that fire in the middle of the street were. They've got their blockades with them, and it appears to me they're either armed with what would appear to be the, the tear gas dispensers. They're, they're carrying tear gas uh, launchers, right. uh, and, they're, yeah, they are, they are kitted up. Uh, and you saw half a dozen uh, tear gas canisters that were uh, lobbed towards that crowd that were sort of moving down towards them. That'll push them back. They'll wait for the tear gas to disperse, and then they'll probably push forward again back down towards the police. Now, as I say, the police, uh, if it was in the UK, they'd be happy to sort of contain the situation and hope that effectively those that are involved in the worst of this violence uh, start to calm down and then disperse. That might happen, it might not. They certainly look as though, you know, their blood is up in terms of 100%. those who want to carry out, a, a, you know, a violent uh, uh, response to what the police are doing here. It's important to say as well now that we appear to have regained camera footage from both sides of this particular riot. So we have footage, as you can see now, right behind those police officers on the very front line and then the other side, and this is where the protesters are, it's in, as we understand it anyway, the Kurdish area, the Kurdish segment, I suppose you could call it, of this city. We're hearing a lot of banging. I'm just going to ask you if we can just turn the volume up very slightly. I'm not sure if we can. I know we're a bit reliant on what we're getting in the feed as the police charge in now. The police are charging past the fire in the street, which was started as a barrier in the crowd have dispersed and beginning to be pushed back. Police officers being pelted with a volley of projectiles as they return fire, as it were, with uh, tear gas, throwing tear gas. The police certainly better equipped than they were before, but... Yeah. I mean, this camera is round the corner from where the main body of protesters are. So at the end of uh, a street that we're looking at here, to the left, that's where the protesters are. You can see it better from this angle, further up where that bonfire is. And now the camera switched to that other side. It keeps switching back and forward. Uh, but uh, you can see right up there, lots and lots of tear gas. And for those police officers uh, that are not uh, fully equipped, that don't have a gas masks and the like, it's going to be uncomfortable for them. For people out of the streets, it's uncomfortable. You can see a smashed up car there, right next to where that main bonfire is. Uh, and then I think that's a Whoa. photographer uh, trying to get one or two snaps and clearly in the line of... Uh, I mean, a word, by the way, just a word for the brave men and women who are holding the cameras in amongst us, showing you the carnage on that street now, the utter devastation on that street in Paris. 
just after this violent update. I mean, car windows smashed in completely, cars destroyed, a fire in the middle of the street, shop windows and shop fronts absolutely battered and bombarded. And this is the street where just moments ago, if you've been tuning into us for a little while now, you will see there were crowds of people on this street protesters, rioters, who'd set up a barricade and a fire. Now, this is interesting because it gives you a, an idea of exactly how fast-moving this event is. Just remember, this is in the middle of Paris, the 10th arrondissement of Paris, so not very sensitive, but 10th arrondissement of Paris, and it is, of course, a normal city. So imagine this taking place right in the middle of Manchester, Liverpool, London, etc., moving from street to street. And we can hear, rather ominously, some loud banging taking place. There. I think that's probably the, uh, the tear gas um, dis uh, uh, tear, tear gas launchers firing more uh, tear gas rounds up towards protesters. Now, I don't know if what that vehicle is, whether it's a civilian vehicle or possibly a police vehicle. They have lots of unmarked police vehicles that they would be using as well. But it's clearly come under attack with the back windows that have been put out there. Uh, but the protesters, as you say, Patrick, who were right down this street, have retreated further back up the street. Yeah. Um, the camera from that position, at least, isn't able to give us an indication as to where these people have gone. But they won't be far away. There was a fair uh, few in that crowd, a good few hundred people, uh, who were there initially. Now, it may be uh, that they've decided to move on to a different area or to disperse because clearly if the police are yeah. now in significant numbers and are able to get to various streets around the core of where this violence is, then the protesters don't necessarily want to be hemmed in uh, and potentially the subject of a, a response and pushed back from the police. Yeah, they are definitely being pushed back. I mean, the concern is, of course, they're just being pushed around a bit in that sense, in terms of around side streets and dispersing. It is such a fast-moving picture, ladies and gentlemen, but when this initially happened, there was well, a handful of police officers, and Mark White and I were sitting here thinking, this is going to get very nasty very quickly. It has got nasty. Now, what we can see is, again, this is now clearly moving throughout that 10th of August in Paris as people are running through the street. Now, this is civilians, potentially people involved in that riot, clutching their eyes and their faces, the tear gas having an effect. And it's just important to remember as well, to remind ourselves exactly where and how this all started. There was a mass shooting earlier on today, and that saw three people die, four injured, two critically. That's the latest as we understand it. We'll give you updates on that as and when we get it. From a 69-year-old man who had previous, when it comes to a migrant attack, an anti migrant attack. This is now spilling out across various different streets in the city. It was originally, it would appear, hemmed into one, kettled in, and now it is spreading out. I am looking at footage from French media. This is on social media, from French media, and what I was able to see earlier on was a police van pull up down the street and be absolutely pelted to the point where it had to stop and the police officers inside it getting out and, well, making making a way, as it were, making a way. Uh, Mark, this is certainly not going to stop any time soon, despite the fact the police have regrouped. Uh, yeah, I mean, and there's no doubt there are injured police officers, Patrick, because we saw them on the footage uh, a little earlier. Because this happened so spontaneously, uh, it took the police by surprise. They weren't there in a capacity of public order. They were there responding to what had been a terrible shooting attack. Uh, and in the aftermath of that, they were there, of course, to help reassure the population. But it's clear uh, people in that area were uh, very angry at what had happened. Uh, and it only takes a few uh, agitators in a crowd to whip up a crowd. And that clearly happened. Uh, because they took the crowd with them. Uh, where that crowd has gone at the moment, we're not quite sure. No. From this angle, we can still see the bonfire further up the street, but it seems to be cleared from the several hundred protesters who were there. Yeah, and I'm just getting some more information through now. And uh, Gerald Darmain, who as far as I can tell, he's uh, French... He's the French interior, interior minister, minister. Uh, their equivalent of the Home Secretary. He said that the suspect... Now, this is in the shooting that took place earlier. The suspect was a shooter in a sports club, he says. 
he had declared many weapons, so he clearly had multiple different weapons. In response to that shooting, the police were then instructed to go to reinforce various different Kurdish areas, Kur Kurdish centres, shops, community centres. And in response to that, clearly a lot of anger in that community, not least perhaps because the individual, the 69-year-old man who was arrested in connection with the shooting at that Kurdish cultural or sports centre, depending on which report you read, was known to police and he had a prior police record, including an arrest for attacking migrants living in tents a year ago. Now, these are shots from earlier on, Mark, aren't they? And this was just as the police... It seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? It yep. wasn't. This is only half an hour or so ago, isn't it? Yeah, that, that was uh, police responding to the initial shooting uh, incident that happened about lunchtime today. You can so see those armed uh, officers, uh, firearms officers, uh, from the French... I mean, all French police are armed, but most of them would just uh, routinely carry a handgun, but those are clearly more specialist firearms officers. Uh, and as you say, additional police were brought in as an act of reassurance to the community, yeah. uh, because any community having suffered uh, an attack like this is going to be quite rightly very concerned. So it's just as you would see after a terrorist attack here in the UK or anywhere else, additional uh, security personnel are brought in to give people that reassurance to make sure there aren't any copycat attacks or any other people linked to the initial attack that might be willing uh, and prepared to do something similar. Uh, so you always see that after. But the difficulty with putting a lot of police in to an area where you have a lot of angry people is they yeah. can they can really be the target for that anger. Live, live shots now, live shots, back to the live shots of what appears to be, well, it's a row, it is a complete and utter concourse of blue lights, whether they're ambulances or police. That's the Arc de Triomphe, is it? That is the Arc de Triomphe. I mean, actually, this is quite an iconic image, Mark, to be honest with you, because that is the Arc de Triomphe, and just either side of it, you have a riot taking place, and then you have um, police officers... Yeah, you see the line there. I was talking about uh, the, the need to get as many... Sorry, just to confirm, that's not the Art of Triumph. Apologies. It's we're another, getting, no, it's another we're getting, arch. Uh, we're, getting, we're getting a lot of fast-moving images here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you can bear with us, don't worry. But carry on, Mark. Yeah. yeah. Uh, lots of beautiful arches in Paris lots if you ever want to visit. But um, you, can, you can see, actually, just down past that arch, and I'll describe it for those radio listeners, is just a row uh, of police vans, blue lights flashing, uh, some not with their flashing lights, but probably a dozen vans at least, because uh, what has been happening over the last 40 minutes or so, as those officers who found themselves under attack from this crowd have been calling for uh, assistance and help from their colleagues. So they will have been coming from all parts of Paris uh, to come and to help in this area in the 10th arrondissement, so the 10th district uh, of Paris. And uh, that vehicle there just coming into shot is a paramedic vehicle from the uh, Le Pompiers, the French Fire and Rescue Service. Unlike in this country, the fire service in France also provide paramedic services, so that's one of their paramedic vehicles. They were there in significant numbers earlier today as well, helping out at the, the site of the earlier shooting attack. Uh, now they're being called back in uh, to this area with absolutely no doubt at all that there will be people who have been injured. We saw it in some of the images, uh, police officers who'd come under uh, a hail of uh, attack from a hail of missiles. Some of them were injured, clutching their heads. There will also be those uh, civilians caught up in this who will be suffering from the effects of tear gas, as we've seen many volleys of tear gas now launched by the French police. Yeah, indeed. Now, it's worth noting that we have had a variety of different camera shots. The one that we are fixed on at the moment appears to show a group of people... Uh, I mean, it's hard for me to quantify at least a dozen, at least a dozen, probably in the 20s, actually, emergency vehicles, all with the blue lights on. And this is just at the spot, or behind the spot, where full-scale riots broke out a little bit earlier on. Now, I'm not sure if we have any other camera shots as well, just to maybe move around, 
We're going to stick with this one for the moment. We're going to stick this one for the moment. Um, now, here's a fast-moving picture, everybody who's been watching and listening. It started earlier on today, a couple of hours ago, a few hours ago, where three people were shot dead, four people injured, two critically by a 69-year-old man who was known to authorities. He basically took a firearm, believed potentially to be numerous firearms, actually, into a Kurdish cultural centre. Like I said, three people dead. That man was known to police for a previous offence involving an anti-immigration attack, an anti-migrant attack at a group of migrants who were living in tents in the city. So he's known to authorities. The police were then sent to bolster security in that area. That is when... The local community there, people who are out on the streets, people who live there, people who were maybe witness to that particular initial attack, took it upon themselves to kick off. And we saw projectiles at police, we had fires in the streets, and certainly for a very long period of time it looked as though it was going to get incredibly, incredibly nasty because police officers had next to no protective gear. We're back now live in the middle of the street and it appears that fire crews have just arrived to put out that fire I was talking about. The crowds have been pushed back. You can still see people milling around, but it's nowhere near as volatile in that specific part of the area as it once was. The emergency services mark no longer outnumbered, it would appear. No, no, you can absolutely see from the images that they're not outnumbered in this uh, particular area anyway, the dozens of uh, police vans there. Now, it's a good sign uh, that the fire service have been able to get in and to extinguish that blaze in the middle of the street, because clearly mm. uh, that indicates that that street, at least, is now safe enough for them to operate, which means that whoever was there mm. have dispersed. Now, whether they've gone to another area where the cameras are not at yet, uh, we don't know. Uh, and I don't know if these are still live images or, or not. Well, but... we're, we're, yeah, we're, they are, as we understand it, and we're just witnessing the fact that just behind the scenes, the so police officers now armed with batons and with shields and with masks have swooped onto a variety of different streets and back streets, and it appears that arrests are being made. Early on, we brought you live images from agitators in amongst a large group in the hundreds of people who were throwing projectiles at police officers. I'm just going to bring in now, just you'll only hear his voice because we're going to stay with these live images, former Border Force Chief Kevin Saunders, and where this attack happened is apparently very close to the immigration offices for the UK, apparently. Kevin, can you just bring us up to date on what you know regarding that, please, as we play people the ongoing right. unfolding pictures from Paris? Take it away, Kevin. Yeah. Hello, Patrick. Um, this isn't very far from Garden Or, the uh, French railway station, where um, UK Border Force officers are based. So I would imagine that there is some concern amongst my former colleagues about what's going on. However, looking at the pictures um, that, that you've got, the French aren't taking this line down. They've got their CRS officers that they've got on the streets, the French rivalries. So um, I've, I've actually been to French police headquarters in Paris, and when something like this kicks off, they're very well organised. They, you know, somebody pushes the red button, and off they go en masse. So, I would and Kevin, imagine, Kevin, yeah, you were saying this, that this is now honest. near the Gare du Nord. We were trying to place exactly where this yeah. was near the Gare du Nord in Paris, which is, of course, a major arterial route in and out of the capital, the French capital. Yes. And as well, Kevin, just emphasise to us: you think there might be some concern for UK border staff who are based there? Is that right? Well, I mean, uh, this isn't very far away, so um, I would imagine that uh, there is concern there. Uh, and Kevin, this, yeah, is they, by, they, this is by—they've got them Kev all out, haven't they? Yeah, Ke Kevin, this I mean, is this by is... no means the first incident similar-ish, unfortunately, to this that Paris has seen. Paris is a volatile place when it comes to race relations, Kevin. Oh yeah, very, very much so. Very much so. Um, a lot of migrants there, a lot of Kurd... This, this area is, you're quite right, it's predominantly Kurdish migrants um, there, and uh, they, they do get worked up fairly easily, although this is a, an awful, an awful event. Um, 
But, I, I, I mean, I, I have a lot of faith in the French police. I think they will get on top of this very quickly. Um, your uh, Mark is right, the, uh, the Pompiers are there, but also the French medical services, the SAMU, S-A-M-U, are there as well. So there are doctors there on the streets as well. So there must be some, uh, some fair old injuries for the, the doctors to be called out as well. Yeah, indeed. And we do have numerous different shots of this. When it first kicked off, we had shots on both sides, actually, from behind the police barricades. And then we had, as well, from the rioters' side. Currently, the shot that we have right now is... And actually, what we're witnessing at the minute is some of those emergency vehicles on the move. There's a column of emergency vehicles, all with the blue lights on, who had flooded to that scene. It's important now, I think, as well, to say that it does appear as though that what was almost one large block of people has dispersed a little bit from what we can see. And not surprising, given the sheer volume of French emergency services who have descended there right now. Difficult to tell exactly what they're doing, but clearly, as Kevin was saying, Mark, I'll bring you back in. Mark Whitehome, and security editor, is with me in the studio right now. The French police uh, have... Uh, well-trodden protocol when it comes to dealing with situations pretty much just like this, riots, basically. Yeah, the, uh, as far as the, uh, the police are concerned, you can see that they're positioning and possibly repositioning. So I don't think we can go as far as to say that the hundreds of people have dispersed. It may be that they've just moved on. Um, but, you know, it's possible uh, that they have decided... Uh, that, you know, they've made their point and they want to go home. Um, yeah. But uh, it may well be... We're, we're only seeing the one camera angle at the moment and they're in a fixed position. Wow. They're certainly where all of the, uh, the police uh, riot vans, the CRS uh, vehicles are, but uh, they're, they're not crucially where any of the officers are in terms of their front line facing or pushing forward. Yeah. So that it's not really giving us an accurate picture of where anybody might still be. Now, I've just had an update. This is from French media, and this is the prosecutor for the Republic of Paris, Laure Bacot, Laure Bacot, who has confirmed that three people have died. We knew that already. That was in the initial shooting. What he said is that one person is in a state of, as he said, absolute emergency. I think we can take that to mean a very critical condition. Two in a less critical condition. He said the defendant is injured, so the shooter, alleged shooter, is injured, including an injury to his face. The police have now, and this is according to French media, we'll wait for this to be confirmed, I'm just reading what I've got here on French media, which is that the police are believed to have opened a terrorism case as the investigation into the shooting continues, and as we've already said, the shooter is believed to have been previously arrested more than a year ago for attacking a migrant camp with a sword, and... New details here, he's only believed to have been released from prison recently. Um, yes, and the police have confirmed now that several people have been injured in these clashes. But we saw that, Mark, didn't we? We saw that taking place. The suspect was known to police, he was known to the intelligence services. And, Mark, this possibly why the local community is so angry. They will feel like the French police have maybe dropped the ball. Well, I think that... From what I was able to glean earlier um, from Paris, there was some real concern about why this individual had been released after seemingly such a short period in prison. Uh, now, whether he was released on bail pending a trial, mm. uh, if that's the case, then you can understand why some people might be angry, because clearly, um, with the events that have transpired, you have a dangerous individual who attacked a migrant camp with a sword, uh, who was in custody for a while, was then released, uh, either having served a very short prison term or released on bail pending a trial. That will clearly have to be, in, in the fullness of time, uh, properly exposed. But when you have a community who have been attacked in this way and they're angry and suspicious, and they're often very suspicious of the authorities, uh, then clearly things and revelations like this have the uh, capacity for stoking even more anger. We know that our equivalent of the Home Secretary, the French 
Interior Minister was in this district of Paris uh, giving a news conference, giving some of these mm. details, and that will have been overseen by uh, quite a number of people who were out there on the streets as well. As I say, what's crucial now for us to try and find out as, as we go forward, Patrick, yeah. is yeah. whether that crowd uh, of very violent people, uh, not all of them, of course, some people were yeah. uh, just along uh, to see what was going on and got caught up in it, but there were certainly some very violent people in there. We saw a hail of missiles, anything they could pick up, being thrown towards uh, the police and injuring some police officers. Have they actually dispersed <coughs> and decided to call it a day? Or have they just moved on to another district that we are not able to bring you live uh, footage from? Still sirens lots of blaring, police activity there. Yeah, sirens absolutely blaring. And we did have initially, anyway, cameramen and women, probably, who were on both sides of this. As the situation is progress now. We have a column of emergency vehicles. They've descended onto the scene there. It's near the Gare du Nord in Paris, in the 10th arrondissement. Um, a man has been arrested, a 69-year-old man, previously known to police, as we've said. Three people died in that incident. The French interior minister said that he is believed to have had multiple weapons with him, and four others have been injured. At least one of them is in an incredibly critical situation. Again, that's according to French authorities. Uh, we will bring you the latest as and when this unfolds. We're going to look at a couple of shots from earlier today. Now, this was just after the shooting, and it's believed to have taken place either at a Kurdish cultural centre or a Kurdish sports centre. It depends exactly which translation, I suppose, that you use from the French reports there, but a cultural centre is the one that we're going with anyway. And what we're seeing here is now the French police moved in. This was earlier on in the day. That sparked riots as more police were sent in to actually help to try to secure the area. And those police initially were taking an absolute pummeling from the crowd there. There were clearly calls on the hop. The protesters waving flags, chanting, ripping up shop fronts, started a fire in the middle of the street. The police kind of retreated in a way, regrouped and came back with a vengeance. And that's culminated in where we are right now. And we will endeavour to try to find you some more images from a slightly different angle. But the latest ones that we've got at the moment... And by the way, certainly earlier, it showed no signs of really slowing down. But the big change is that the, there is a column of emergency services now, a column of emergency services, which have kind of barricaded off, actually, a little bit of our shot. But this does not mean that the action isn't still taking place further down that road, and we suspect it probably is, because there was a huge number of people. And as night-time falls in Paris, well, I would expect that there aren't going to be many members of the authorities, Mark White, who are going to get a particularly good night's sleep. No, one of the real concerns that authorities always have in the aftermath of a terrorist attack is the potential for community uh, violence, that uh, the, the local population are going to react badly to what has happened here. And that is certainly one of the main concerns they had in Paris. Yeah, absolutely. OK, very shortly, we're going to be speaking to former Metropolitan Police Officer Peter Blexley. We're just getting him on the line right now just to talk about this riot control and this crowd control. Mark? So just on this issue about the potential for violence, what... The concern is you have seen, of course, the reaction when you get uh, Islamist terrorist attacks in European cities. Quite often, what will happen is that camera heads are out there and it turns into a vigil and candles are yes, lit yeah. and people reflect and it doesn't turn tend to be an angry affair. But there is always that potential. In this instance, this has been clearly... Uh, uh, an angry affair that perhaps has been stoked up by a few. We saw those individuals there jumping on cars, shouting to people to push forward and to throw things towards the police. And the real concern that the authorities will have with this happening yeah. is the, the last thing they want, especially in France, where they've had problems in the past between different races and communities. They don't want race riots to take a grip of Paris or indeed other areas in this city. We're hearing some worrying reports now, Patrick, that there may be some disturbances that have broken out in Marseille as well, which really? has a very 
ethnically diverse population, often the scene of trouble, and some reports that trouble has flared uh, in Marseille as well. So the, the French authorities will be desperately hoping that, you know, whatever happened may have dissipated, that they can get a lid on it, that this doesn't spread and become a more sustained uh, campaign of violence against the authorities. Yeah, absolutely. No, and you're right, Mark. There are reports coming through. We're not going to elaborate on this right now. I'm not going to elaborate on this right now because these are just reports and we don't want to make sure that... Well, we don't want to get anything wrong, obviously. But, yes, there are increasing numbers of people, albeit either on social media or on French media, actually, reporting anyway that incidents may have also broken out in Marseille. I'll leave it there on the Marseille angle for the moment because we don't know that for sure at the minute and that's not been confirmed and I want to make sure that's all shored up before we elaborate on it. But Mark White, our Home Security Editor, joins me throughout. He will be keeping a very, very close eye on that because if indeed it is the case that the Kurdish community in this area, who have suffered very tragically the loss, it would appear anyway, of at least three members of their local community for... Others injured, at least one incredibly critically, from according to French police. A, a groundswell of sentiment, anger, really, from that community. They feel as though the individual suspected of the shooting, and it's important, again, to say there is only one suspect in the shooting. It's pretty clear that the French authorities are absolutely confident they've got the guy who did it. They are saying that he was a chap who was arrested previously and served a prison sentence previously, or served time in prison anyway, for attacking with an, a sword of some migrants who were in a tent in the city. We know that, given the migrant state in France at, at the moment, that there are these areas where migrants live in tents around the city, around Paris. There was an attack that took place there. They clearly feel as though that it wasn't dealt with particularly well. He was back out on the streets and then this has happened. And uh, potentially then you can see that if this has the ability to kickstart a chain of events, if there is an undercurrent of uh, feeling, ill feeling amongst various different communities right across France, this maybe could well be a catalyst for that to erupt. Hearing reports, as Mark White said earlier there, about a potential incident taking place in Marseille as well. What we're going to do is we're going to just take a quick break in a second. Mark White will stay in the studio with me here, our Home Security Editor. We will stay locked onto these images. We'll keep abreast of it all. And when we come back, we'll also have Peter Blexley, who's a former Metropolitan Police officer. If you're just joining us, quickly before I throw to this break, a large-scale violent riot in the middle of Paris. At least three people died previously in a shooting, four injured, two critically, a 69-year-old man arrested in response to that shooting. It is believed to be an anti-migrant attack. We'll go to a break. When we come back, we'll have more. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 pm on GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At six, it's Deems and Co. Seven o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. So I'm please. completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. 
every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Rathbay. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello there, welcome back. I'm Bethany Elsie with your top stories from the GB newsroom. Protests have erupted at the scene of a shooting which left three people dead at a Kurdish cultural centre in Paris. It's been confirmed those who were killed are from the Kurdish community. Live pictures show violent demonstrations taking place right now with clashes against police. A 69-year-old suspect has been detained by police in connection with the attack. According to French media, the suspect was known to police and allegedly attacked a migrant camp last year. The health secretaries called the newly announced strikes by nurses on the 18th and 19th of January disappointing and says they're in no one's best interests. The Royal College of Nursing says the walkouts will go ahead unless the government opens negotiations over pay. Meanwhile, the GMB's called off a post-Christmas strike by ambulance workers in England and Wales. They'll now strike on the 11th of January. What do we want? 10%. When do we want it? No! The Prime Minister has apologised for Christmas travel disruption following strike action by Border Force staff today. Heathrow, Gatwick, Birmingham, Cardiff, Glasgow and Manchester airports are all affected, but Heathrow claims it's operating as normal. Military personnel and volunteers from the civil service have been trained to step in. And George Cohen, part of England's 1966 World Cup winning team, has died at the age of 83. Cohen played every minute of the victorious campaign on home soil and in total won 37 caps for his country. His former club, Fulham, announced his death this morning. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now, let's get back to Patrick. OK, ladies and gentlemen, you join me in the middle of a very fast-moving breaking situation in Paris. We'll endeavour to give you the latest before anybody else. Throughout the show, we have been following these violent clashes between the police and Kurdish protesters. Frankly, it started after an individual, a 69-year-old man, is believed to have shot and killed three people. Live pictures is what you're seeing now as night descends in Paris. And we witnessed earlier on, anyway, police arresting a 69-year-old man. He's believed to have shot and killed three people, another person in critical condition. The man himself has received a significant injury to his face, as we understand it. He remains in police cu custody and in hospital. He was only recently released from police custody after an attack using a sword on a migrant tent in Paris as well. And what we are witnessing at the moment, live footage, the police descending on that area. There was full-blown riots taking place, violent riots. Police initially outnumbered. It looked as though it was going to get incredibly nasty indeed. And what is concerning now, ladies and gentlemen, again, is that it appears to me from this footage that we're witnessing right now, yes, there are banks and banks and banks of police, but potentially just down the other end of the street, the crowds gathering again. 
So we had an initial incident where there was hundreds of Kurdish people, believed to be Kurdish people, at the incident took place in a, com a Kurdish area, a uh, Kurdish community centre, gathered outnumbering the police. The police then withdrew and regrouped and came back and the crowd dispersed. It appears to me anyway, from what I'm seeing and I've just seen when the camera pan round, that now both the crowd and the police are in rather large number. Let's just get an idea of how difficult it is to police a situation a bit like this with ex-Met Police Officer Steve Roberts. Steve joins me down the line. We're going to stick with these live images so you will just be hearing Steve's voice. Uh, but, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. We're obviously reacting to this as this news comes in. But how difficult is it to police a situation like this, so fast-moving, so violent, and the potential for it to kick right off? It's very difficult indeed, and it's particularly difficult in these early stages uh, where the, the police service doesn't quite know what it's dealing with, uh, but needs to muster a large number of officers quickly in order to neutralise any violence that's going on. But at the same time, they've got to be very careful not to provoke even greater violence. But as night falls, they should be able to establish what the position is and hopefully get in touch with some community interveners, people from the Kurdish community who can talk to their own side and try and calm this situation down before it spirals out of control. Yeah, and Steve, I'm witnessing just in front of me here, people won't be seeing this on the screen because this is, like I said, such a fast-moving situation, but it's footage from earlier on, which is actually a lot of people in that crowd of protesters, rioters, who really went at the police and they really charged at them uh, hurling projectiles at them. I can see police officers injured, some quite badly actually injured. And is it important that the police do not let their emotions get to them in these situations? Because presumably, when you see your colleagues lying on the floor in a pool of blood, it's easy for you to lose your cool, and that might escalate the situation even more. Absolutely. It's absolutely vital uh, that the police don't do anything which makes the situation worse, which provokes more violence. Their job there is to keep their heads uh, and to damp down violence, to uh, try and separate those people who are trying to make trouble from the many, many other people who will simply be caught in the same situation and actually want to get away and, and mm. not be a problem, to try and funnel those people away and to try and concentrate the, the police strength that they have got on those few people who are actually making trouble. But yes, of course, it's it's very provoking to have people throwing bricks, petrol bombs, whatever, at you. And it, it, it's very worrying when you see your colleagues being injured. But the job of these officers is to try and make sure that people are safe, that property is safe, mm. and that the public are allowed to demonstrate their outrage at this appalling situation, but not allowed to create more violence. And, Stephen, added layer to this, this isn't, you know, football fans versus police or one of those incidents. There is quite clearly a racial element to this. The attack itself that initially kick-started this is unequivocally, according to French authorities, well, it's a racist attack. It was targeting... They said it wasn't deliberately necessarily targeting the Kurdish community, immigrants in general. Either way, I think we're splitting hairs there at this point, Steve. It's, there is a racial undertone to this, and does that make it even more difficult to police? Yes, indeed, it does. Intercommunity violence is always very difficult to police, particularly in the case, and I think this is so in Paris at the moment, where the, the victim community, if you like, uh, already has quite tense relationships with the police service. So this requires call heads on all sides uh, if fewer people are to end up being injured and, you know, hopefully no more people being killed. Yeah. Now, Steve, I'm just going to hand you over. Mark White, our Home and Security Editor, joins me now. Very shortly, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to a French journalist who's been in and around this. But, Mark, take it away. Yeah, afternoon, Steve. I, I was just... I'm going to ask you about the, the comparison and the way that uh, French public order officers uh, police these types of events. And it wasn't a public order event to begin with, but there was big, large crowds there. We heard, uh, according to local reporters there, uh, about complaints that the police had been a bit heavy-handed. Now, we know that the, the French police can be a bit robust in comparison to the British... Uh, police, does that ring true to you? It's uh, not really news to say that the police in France are quicker 
and readier to resort to using weapons. They are better physically protected themselves, but they are far more heavily equipped with tear gas, with baton rounds, and it's a simply different policing tradition uh, to what we have in the UK. Um, and we've seen the results of that over many, many years in all sorts of different public order situations in Paris. It's, it's not so very long ago that we could see rioters in the Champs-Élysées battling with police, uh, the, the so-called um, Yellow Vest protests. But it does require cool heads on all sides to try and ensure as few people as possible are injured. Well, it's a, a very pertinent point on uh, the requirement for cool heads. How concerned are you? And, you know, France is no stranger, really, sadly, to race riots uh, of the events in the 10th arrondissement in Paris spreading to other parts of Paris, other towns and cities in France. We've heard about some disturbances not confirmed as yet uh, from Marseille in the south. Steve? I think we might have lost Steve, unfortunately. There we go. But that was Steve Roberts. We might be trying to get I'm sure back. he would have been concerned. I'm sure, I'm <laughs> sure he would have been concerned. Now, shortly, anyway, we're going to be, hopefully anyway, bringing you a French journalist who will be able to pick this apart. But I believe we can go back to Steve, actually. Steve Roberts, who is a former Met Police officer, who's filling you in on exactly how police deal with these things. And I, I think Mark was just asking you there, Steve, about the fact that, look, unconfirmed reports at the moment, Steve, unconfirmed reports, want to stress that, but at least some rumblings that there's been an incident in Marseille as well. Steve, what is the potential for this to maybe have a ripple effect across France? Tragically, we've seen this all too often, that the, the outer suburbs of Paris can be triggered into violence remarkably easily. It's not just a matter of demonstrations and violence in the centre of Paris. And right across provincial France, there always seems to be a potential uh, for a trigger event to take place and for disenfranchised communities right across the country uh, to spark into violence. And that's something that will be very much in the minds of the French uh, public order and security officials and the politicians who lead okay. them. Look, Steve, thank you very much for that. Steve Roberts there, former Met Officer. Now, Mark White was just showing me something that's just dropped, I believe. Yeah, interestingly, this is France 24, uh, saying that members of the Kurdish community in Paris uh, have told reporters that they had recently been warned by police of threats to Kurdish areas that uh, the Kurdish community could be the target for attacks and some real concern uh, amongst people within the Kurdish community that they were not uh, properly protected. So that may be uh, one of the reasons why you're seeing angry scenes uh, from those gathering in this Kurdish area of central Paris. And the live images that you're seeing now are police officers and other members of other different emergency services trying to put out fires that are taking place there in response to, uh, well, the police and crowds battle pretty much with each other. Let's go now to Paris-based journalist David Shazan, who is in Paris for us at the moment. Uh, David, we're going to keep the images on the screen of the events unfolding on the street there, but, David, what's the latest from where you are? Well, the latest, obviously, are these clashes between Kurdish demonstrators and uh, the police. And according to what we've been hearing from witnesses and from the French media, what seems to have triggered the violence was when the French interior minister, Gérald Darmanin, arrived at the scene and then the police threw up a, a cordon to protect him from any uh, possible trouble. And that's when the protesters started throwing bicycle wheels, rocks, pretty much anything they could find at the police. And the police have been firing tear gas to try to disperse the protesters. And I think there are several different elements to this. It looks very much like this was 
uh, an anti-immigrant attack. That is certainly what the French authorities and the interior minister are saying. And the suspect who's been arrested is a 69-year-old former rail worker who was already facing trial for racist violence and has a previous conviction uh, as well. Um, but nine years ago, three Kurdish activists, three female Kurdish activists, one of whom was closely associated with a banned Turkish militant group called the PKK, uh, which is battling for an independent Kurdish state on what's now uh, Turkish and Iraqi territory. The, those three female activists were killed in Paris, and uh, uh, a man was arrested, a Turkish citizen, but certainly members of the Turkish community here are convinced that the Turkish intelligence services were behind those killings, and they believe that the French authorities don't do enough to protect them. Yeah, well, so clearly there's been a hotbed there for a while. Now, just in terms of this area, OK, because bear in mind, David, Mark White, our Home Security Editor and myself, we're sat here, we're in London, we were getting this dropping through us, the live images brought to us just as this really kicked off, and it was a very chaotic situation. So what do you know about this specific area where this is currently taking place? What we have here is it's the 10th arrondissement. I'm, I've never been there myself, just... Talk me through what, what this area is like here right now. Yeah, I mean, it is an ethnically mixed area. It's about 20 minutes walk from where I live, so I know it well. Um, a formerly working class area that's now got a lot of hipster style restaurants and so on. So it's very much a neighborhood in transition, uh, quite volatile sometimes, I suppose you could say. And there are a lot of Kurdish restaurants there as well, which are very popular. One of those restaurants was featured by a celebrity chef, Anthony Bourdain, uh, now uh, uh, deceased, the American celebrity chef, who uh, made that restaurant quite popular with hipsters. So I'd say it's a, a, a formerly working class area in the process of gentrification because property okay. prices are rising all across central Paris. Okay. OK, David, look, can I just say thank you very much for coming on an incredibly short notice and I think Sorry, providing some really vital information for us here. David Shazan there is a Paris-based journalist. If you are just joining us, this is GB News and we are reacting live and the images that you're seeing there are live of initially a mass shooting at a Kurdish community centre that has left at least three people dead, four people injured, two of them critically, the perpetrator of that attack is believed to be a 69-year-old former rail worker who, it is understood, was facing trial for a race-related incident and has a previous conviction for a race-related incident. We learned as well that members of that Kurdish community, it's a large Kurdish community in that specific bit of Paris there, the 10th arrondissement area of Paris, had been warned that the potential for attack was imminent. They clearly feel let down by authorities. The attack took place. The gentleman believed to be responsible is in custody. He's injured himself, a facial injury, according to local reports. And what happened then was the interior minister of France decided to flood the area. Well, not flood it, just send a few, actually, police officers there. Initially, as a sign of security and solidarity, that then actually sparked riots, and those vi riots were violent police, massively outnumbered in the first instance by protesters, by rioters. They were pelted with projectiles. They were injured. They then withdrew, regrouped, came back, and the latest that we're seeing now, which you're seeing now, is of relative calm. I say relative, I mean, given what's just taken place, the police officers in the streets, and that crowd appears to be dispersed. That's the latest. We'll return to this a bit later on. What we're going to do is just break off from that main story now and come back to something a little bit closer to home because we're going to talk about the GB News's People's Poll. 
Earlier this week, the High Court ruled that the government's plan to relocate asylum seekers to Rwanda was lawful after legal challenges from charities, campaign groups, etc. Now, one of the findings in this week's GB News People poll is that 40% of the public supported the government to make arrangements for relocating asylum seekers to Rwanda rather than Britain. So, what you can see on the graphics in front of you there, we'll explain all this in a bit more detail, but 40% of people support it, and that was the majority in terms of the groupings of people there. 29% opposed, 12% neither opposed nor supported, and 18% preferred not to say or didn't know. We're going to have a bit of a debate on this now because joining me to discuss this is UK immigration lawyer Harjab Singh Bangal and former Brexit Party MEP and political commentator Belinda De Lucy. Thank you very much. We were rather overtaken by events there, I must be said, but I'm sure we can both understand why. I'll start with you, Belinda, when it comes to this. Is it any surprise to you that the number of people in our people's poll is at 40% who support, which is an overwhelming majority of people who we've surveyed when you look at the other groups anyway, supports the deportation to Rwanda? Um, I'm surprised it's not a bit more, actually. I think it is the only uh, plan that any of the main parties have to try and discourage all the human trafficking um, and the sort of mass open border issue we have at the moment with economic migrants abusing our system. You know, I have lots of concerns about the Rwanda policy in itself, but what is fantastic about this ruling is that it's actually showing that the government does have some control still. You know, the big question is, who runs this country? And for a few months since the ECHR stopped that plane going to Rwanda from getting off the ground, there mm. was a, a, a very justifiable concern that actually, who governs us? What's the point in voting for our MPs when foreign judges and foreign courts get to rule over us? So, you Absolutely. know, that was, it's a great sign, but it's not enough. Well, Belinda, this has been an age-old debate, and I'll throw it over to Harjab, because, Harjab, when people look at the situation now, which I think more and more people are increasingly becoming uh, aligned to the idea that maybe we should be doing something with Rwanda and getting some of those flights taken off, do you think that will make the government more inclined to ignore foreign judges? No, I, I, what's going to happen is it all depends whether this scheme's going to be successful or not. There's only 200 spaces in Rwanda, and it's going to cost us millions, if not billions. I don't think that's going to deter. That won't even deter a day's crossing. What's more of a deterrent is what Rishi Sunak announced, and we do have an alternative, that we're going to fast-track asylum claims and deal with them in 10 days. And we used to have this before 2012. So under the Labour government, there used to be a fast-track system where if someone would come in on a Monday and claim asylum, by Friday their claim would be decided and they'd be refused. In yeah. Harmonsworth, in, in West London, near Heathrow Airport with a detention centre, they even have a court on site in the detention centre. So if oh, you wow. appeal the decision on Friday, your hearing's on Monday. And if that gets refused, you could be on a plane by Wednesday. Well, so I, I've, I've seen people sent back in 20 days, but under the, the for the last, say, 12-odd years under the Conservative yeah. government, the safe list has gone, the fast-track system has gone, and oddly replaced well, Harjab, by I'll, 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 I'll stop you there. people back. I'll stop you there, because I think you've hit the nail on the head. And Belinda, has Harjab not actually identified something that people have been saying for a long time, which is, right, the Rwanda thing, fine, OK, cool. You get a few people on a plane off to Rwanda. If you lob a cruise ship in the channel as well, some kind of offshore detention, yeah, and you also increase the speed and the resources for people to have their asylum claims processed, it's only with that multi-pronged approach that we'll actually get anything done. Otherwise, the Tories are toast. I don't think the fast track thing is going to help with numbers because at, at the moment we're already fast, tra you know, not fast tracking, but allowing 55 percent of Albanian uh, so-called asylum seekers through our system and accepting them when they're clearly not asylum seekers. So speeding that up isn't going to stop the numbers. We need to stop them coming here in the first place. And I don't think the government's been tough enough for that. We keep dangling the carrot. If your foot steps on our beaches, your, your chances of staying here, even with the Rwanda policy, because you're right, barely anyone will get on that plane, by the way, because as the judgment said, you know, the eight people who took the cake to course have, have had their rights to stay, you know, supported for now. And so the Rwanda policy is more of a deterrent. That's not going to help with the numbers. We need to make sure that anyone who arrives here on the boats has no right to stay here whatsoever. There's no point in fast-tracking if we're still letting the majority all through.
All right, look, Harjab, I would love to go back to you. Unfortunately, I can't because we've been overtaken by what's been going on in Paris and also I've got another studio guest here which I need to fit in. The running order has been ripped up, I'm afraid, as I'm sure you can both understand as a result of the events in Paris. But both of you, thank you very much. Harjab Bangal Singh now, of course, who's UK immigration lawyer and as well, Belinda De Lucy, as well, former Brexit Party MEP, reacting to the People's Poll regarding Rwanda. 40% of people think it's a good thing to basically get people on planes. We're moving on now just quickly because the Royal College of Nursing is today they announced fresh strike dates on the 18th and the 19th of January. Warnings of more to come next year unless those pay talks are resumed. The latest on that is that the government has said, no, we're not going to talk to you about pay. The nurse is still not budging when it comes to around a 19% pay rise, even in Scotland. Members of the union up there, the Royal College of Nursing, rejected a 7.5% average pay rise offer, so they rejected that. Anyway, the GMB union has called off an ambulance strike action planned for just after Christmas but announced a new walkout on the 11th of January instead. Fresh strikes are announced left, right and centre. But, yes, there's loads of people who have been getting in touch about this. Very concerned here to pick through it all is Lucy Johnson, Health and Social Affairs Editor of the Sunday Express. Right, should we start with the latest round on strikes? Nurses not backing down? Uh, yeah, exactly. And it seems that the government uh, will appear to be being a bit intransigent about it. They're not prepared to talk about pay. But then, on the other hand... Um, I think it's well recognised that, uh, you know, we haven't got 19% uh, pay rise to give nurses. No. Um, <clears throat> the country is broke. So it needs, you know, it seems to be there's a deadlock and it's someone has to, they need to get back round the table and talk um, <clears throat> and perhaps offer a 7.5%, maybe with an increase for next year. Um, uh, Otherwise, it will just carry on. Well, this is interesting. This broke actually just half an hour ago. I'm just seeing it now. And it is that talks between the health secretary and unions ended without a, a pay offer being made. Now, that bit we knew. But what we didn't know, and this is new, is apparently the Scottish government is saying that it's going to impose its offer of a 7.5% average pay rise on nurses. That's north of the border. Potentially something that could happen down here? Um, potentially. I mean, I think there'll be a fight whatever way you cut it. Um, and I think what's happened is that perhaps, you know, um, the, the nurses have pivoted the narrative rather, as well as all the unions have, to now talk about not just pay, but to talk about the NHS in general. And so they're saying that, you know, this is about patient care, this is about the fact we can't care for, you know, we can't mm. look after people okay. safely. And that has winning over public support, and even if the strikes uh, do die down and they come to some settlement, where does that leave the NHS? And mm. that narrative will still continue. Lucy, I'm very sorry that you've made all the effort to come into the studio for what has equated to about 90 seconds worth of a broadcast there, but that's the nature of the business that we're in, unfortunately, given what's been going on in Paris. Lucy Johnson, Health and Social Affairs Editor of the Sunday Express. When I come back, I will bring you the very latest on the violent outbreaks in Paris. At least three people dead after a mass shooting and riots. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Big day already today. It's just gone at five o'clock. Violent clashes erupted in Paris earlier after a mass shooting left three people dead, several injured. Police with riot shields faced Kurdish protesters at the scene of the attack, which took place near a Kurdish community centre. It kicked right off. We had live images of that. We'll go back to those very, very shortly. Get emails coming in as well and a whole range of topics that we're going to be talking about today. We were doing the gender recognition madness that's taking place up in Scotland. We've got the latest round of strikes, border falls, are on strike and the people's poll as well which turns out that 40 percent of you four zero percent think those flights to rwanda should take off asap gb views at gb news dot uk we're going to give you your headlines now but yes like i said when i come back we'll have the very very latest from ongoing violent clashes in paris stay tuned Patrick, thank you. Good afternoon. It's one minute past five. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Violent clashes have broken out in central Paris, near to where a gunman opened fire, killing three people from the Kurdish community and injuring several others. <laughs> Members of the community gathered around the police cordon to express anger at the attack, raising concerns it could be racially motivated. But demonstrations turned into riots, police threw tear gas and protesters lit fires in the streets. A 69-year-old has been detained and police have launched an investigation into murder, manslaughter and aggravated violence. French media say the suspect was known to police and allegedly attacked a migrant camp last year. The health secretaries called the newly announced strikes by nurses on the 18th and 19th of January disappointing and says they're in no one's best interests. The Royal College of Nursing says the walkouts will go ahead unless the government opens negotiations over pay. Meanwhile, the GMB's called off a post-Christmas strike by ambulance workers in England and Wales. They'll now strike on the 11th of January. The union's national secretary, Rachel Harrison, thanked the public for their support. The public are deeply worried about our NHS, and we are too. People across the country have been incredible in backing our members and NHS workers, and we care so much about them. That's why we are suspending the proposed GMB industrial action on the 28th of December. We know the public will appreciate being able to enjoy Christmas without any additional anxiety. The Prime Minister has apologised for Christmas travel disruption following strike action by Border Force staff today. What do we want? 10%! When do we want it? No! Heathrow, Gatwick, Birmingham, Cardiff, Glasgow and Manchester airports are all affected, but Heathrow claims it's operating as normal. Military personnel and volunteers from the civil service have been trained to step in. Rishi Sunak insists public sector pay must be controlled to keep down inflation. 
First of all, I'm, I'm really sad and I'm disappointed about the disruption that is being caused to so many people's lives, particularly at Christmas time. What I'm trying to do is make the right long-term decisions for the country, for everybody's benefit. And I think we all know that the, the major economic challenge we all face now is inflation. It's inflation that's eating into everyone's pay packets, it's you know, rising the cost of living. And I want to make sure that we reduce inflation. Part of that is being responsible when it comes to setting public sector pay. GB News understands airlines are facing millions of pounds in extra fuel costs as they try and deal with likely long delays during the border force strike. British Airways is one of a number of airlines instructing its pilots to take on additional fuel to help cope with the holding in the skies for up to an extra hour. A senior aviation source says the contingency plans were essential but extremely costly. A woman has been killed after being struck by a police car during a chase of a suspected stolen vehicle. Greater Manchester police say the 53-year-old was taken to hospital but died a short time later after the collision in Oldham this morning. The Prime Minister says it's completely reasonable for the UK government to consider blocking new gender legislation in Scotland. Rishi Sunak's comments come after MSPs voted yesterday to pass the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. It lowers the age when people can apply to change their legal gender from 18 to 16. And it also removes the need for a medical diagnosis. Holyrood has warned any attempted intervention from the UK government will be vigorously contested. A powerful Arctic storm is sweeping across large parts of the US and Canada, with temperatures plunging as low as minus 45 degrees. Experts are warning exposure to bare skin could lead to frostbite within minutes. More than 100 million people are under weather alerts during the busiest travel days of the year. The storm is forecast to develop into what's being described as a bomb cyclone, bringing with it heavy, blinding snow. Motorists are being warned to expect long delays as millions hit the road to spend Christmas with friends and family. The AA says today will be the busiest day of the festive period, with an estimated 17 million journeys being made across the UK. A strike tomorrow by thousands of RMT members working at Network Rail is expected to make matters worse. The walkout will last until the 27th of December. And George Cohen, who was part of England's 1966 World Cup winning team, has died at the age of 83. Cohen played every minute of the victorious campaign on home soil and in total won 37 caps for his country. His former club, Fulham, announced his death this morning. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now let's get back to Patrick. OK, welcome back, people. We're going to go straight in with our top story today, which is there's been violent clashes between protesters and police in Paris. This follows a shooting at a Kurdish community centre which left three people dead, several critically injured. Members of the Kurdish community then protested near the scene following an address by the French interior minister in which he said he wasn't sure if the attacker was specifically targeting Kurdish People. He did, however, say that it was clear that the attacker was specifically targeting immigrants. It's also important to note that the individual believed to be the suspect, well, who is the suspect, 69-year-old former rail worker who had been facing trial for a racially aggravated offence and has a previous conviction for a racially aggravated offence. Mark White joins me right now. I believe we've got live pictures as well of what's been going on over there. Mark White, our Home and Security Editor, what's going on? Uh, well, we are looking at a situation now where... Uh, there are still significant crowds, it seems. Uh, the police are there. They've been able... There's chat there on a, a, a loudspeaker, I'm sure a community leader, calling for calm mm. in that area because they're very angry and lots of uh, accusations and recriminations, uh, uh, claims that actually it was Turkey that was behind this. Well, just talk me through that a little bit, Mark, because we did have a, an individual on earlier on who was a Paris-based but British journalist who said that there had been anger stoked in that Kurdish community from a previous attack years ago that was believed to have been Turkish versus Kurdish, and then he alluded to that maybe being part of this one. What's, what's the latest there that, that you think's happened? Well, of course, no love lost between well, the yeah. two because uh, you have 
Uh, people in what they describe as Greater Kurdistan, and that borders Turkey and Iraq and Iran, who want you know, their home nation, and in parts of Iraq they have that level of autonomy, mm. not the same in Turkey. We know that, for instance, uh, the extremist group, the PKK, that uh, the, the, the Turks have mm. um, prescribed as a terrorist organisation are responsible and have been responsible for many terrorist attacks in Turkey over the years. And, of course, on the other side, the Turkish accused of uh, many atrocities towards Kurdish people. So that gives you some of the background as to why the Kurdish people uh, are claiming, or some of them at least, that this shooting has come at yeah. the behest of uh, President Erdogan, the Turkish leader. Absolutely. Well, what we're looking at right now is a bank, a relatively small initial bank, followed by several different other rows of French police and emergency services. And then as the camera pans around there, which is what we're looking at right now, is a large crowd of well, one would imagine anyway, Kurds who are in that area. It's a Kurdish area. Now, it's important to say, as we take these images live, that it was just on this street and on the streets around it where not so long ago, about half an hour ago, there were incredibly violent clashes between police and the protesters. It must be said that most of the violence was coming from the protesters, projectiles, etc., being thrown at police. The police force were not wearing a lot of protective gear at the time. That has changed. We saw police officers getting injured. We saw tear gas then deployed. Now, this appears to be somewhat of a standoff. At the moment, Mark Why? there's nothing particularly violent taking place, but those crowds dispersed for a while, they are back again, and the chanting has just started again. This does have the potential for more violence to erupt, one would have thought. Yeah, I mean, the concerning thing about this site is that we're back to uh, this street and this district Same now, street. very significantly crowded uh, with individuals who are clearly uh, impassioned and emotional there. To give you an indication of some of the things that they're saying, um, the journalists have been hearing from Murat Roni, uh, who is uh, a Kurdish uh, gentleman who visits that cultural centre that was the subject of the attack. He says he comes regularly to the cultural centre. He described it like the embassy for Kurds in Paris, uh, a gathering place for cultural events, political discussion, assistance with immigration procedures and the like. A house, he says, where all Kurds get together. Now, this, I think, goes to the crux of why there's so much anger here. Absolutely. He says, we do not feel protected in Paris. After Friday's shooting, he said, uh, we do not at all feel protected in Paris by the authorities, by the police. And that's why we've got the recriminations now and the accusations towards the police. The police are a symbol of authority. Uh, and you will often see with an angry crowd that symbol of authority will find themselves being targeted. And clearly that happened before. It has to be hoped that calmer wow. heads prevail now. Well, what we are witnessing now can only be described as a standoff between <laughs> Kurdish protesters, the chanting you will be able to hear in the background now. Now, it is this exact same street where we brought you live images roughly around half an hour, 45 minutes ago, of out-and-out out violence, projectiles being thrown, fires in the street, French police officers charging, tear gas, batons wielded, then retreating and regrouping. And this is the culmination of that situation now. Hundreds and hundreds of, one would imagine, mostly Kurdish men, as we can see there, face-to-face, -face, nose to nose with the French police officers. And as the camera will pan round again shortly, one would imagine, there is a huge row of French police officers. It's an incredibly narrow street. I'm just going to read you a couple of things from French media who are on the scene. Emmanuel Macron, the French president, has now spoken about this. It's a brief statement. He said it's an odious attack. This attack left three people dead, four people injured. It's believed to be a far-right anti-immigrant attack. Anyway, he said it's an odious attack. He said his thoughts are with the victims. And I'm sticking with French media, who are claiming... We are waiting for confirmation on this, and I want to make that very clear, but French media are claiming now that of the three victims, one was a woman and two men have died. OK, so that's of the people who have died. French media, unconfirmed French media reporting, one was a lady and there were two men involved as well. And a witness, or a lady at least claiming to be a witness, is reporting and telling French media 
that the gunman targeted a Kurdish cultural center, but also a nearby shop and a hairdresser's as well. One would imagine there a row of a row of shops in this particular area. Just to fill you in again, what you are seeing now, and I think this is a real concern for people, is these crowds of people had dispersed. The French police had come in, they'd scattered. They are now back and they are regrouped. The French police, they dispersed because they were all over the area. We saw the vans coming in with the blues and twos on. The police have now gathered, and this is not stopping anytime soon because we now have on a very narrow street in the 10th arrondissement in Paris, there's a big Kurdish area, a big multicultural area, very much two groups of people here, the police and the Kurds just styballing each other, really. Yeah, I mean, they've, you know, a right to be there, to protest, to make their voices heard about a terrible attack that took place today and to voice their very real concern that they say they're not being properly protected by authorities in Paris. The real concern, though, Patrick, will be what happens next, because it doesn't take much. Yeah. You can hear from the crowd that, you know, they are pretty volatile, that they're uh, quite angry uh, with what has happened. And as we saw before, it was only a few individuals in the crowd mm. who were up on lampposts, up on the tops of vehicles, that were then encouraging others to pick up uh, bricks and other missiles mm. and chairs and the like and throw them at the police. And then it descended into some quite serious violence. A number of police officers injured at that point. Well, as I understand it, French police are currently undertaking a search of the suspect's home. He's a 69-year-old man, believed to be a former rail worker, with a previous conviction for a violent, aggravated attack involving a weapon on migrants in tents in that city. And that is incredibly relevant, not least because of the nature of this current shooting right now, believed to be deliberately targeting, as he would say, migrants, Kurds. And the feeling in that community, as we see now earlier images taking place of that riot, the feeling in the community of being let down by the police officers, of being let down by French security forces, of probably being let down possibly anywhere, you could say, by the French government as well, because they feel as though they were not protected enough. And as Mark White revealed live on GB News earlier on, there had been reports from amongst that Kurdish community that they had been made aware of the risk or the potential of an attack and they do not feel protected. And that goes a long way to explaining why we're seeing such vitriol now between the local Kurdish community and the police if a standoff continues to take place in Paris, neither side going anywhere. And Mark, as you've said, there is the potential for this to go incredibly volatile, incredibly quickly. We already saw that happen earlier on. And it is because these people feel incredibly let down by their security services. Yes, uh, the, diff uh, the difference this time is that there are very many more French police officers and police officers in full riot kit uh, that have been brought into the area. Uh, for half an hour, 40 minutes or more, they were heavily outnumbered mm. because they weren't expecting to police a riot. They were there, as always happens after a terrible incident like this, uh, to help police the area, to act as reassurance. They were also there because the French interior minister, who is the French equivalent of the Home Secretary, arrived at the scene to take a tour of the scene, to give a news, an impromptu news conference. Now, what I'm told by some local journalists there as well, I've been speaking uh, to some of the people that were there, mm. is that they claim that the French threw a ring around the interior minister, as you would expect. He's yeah. a high-profile politician, but they claim that the French police were a bit heavy-handed in doing that. They may have been, um, but this is what they have said anyway to local journalists, and that was the spark yeah. for the anger then pointed towards the police, that and the fact they claim not to have been fully protected despite being warned some time ago by the police about the potential for members of the Kurdish community to come under attack. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we're going to stick with this throughout the course of the show, OK? Well, then we're going to keep coming back and forward to it. We've got images of the situation unfolding in Paris at the moment. We're going to move away from it for now and we'll dip back in and out of it because, like I've said, at the moment, anyway, it is very much a standoff between hundreds of Kurdish men and 
French riot police. OK, and that situation does not appear to be moving very quickly anytime soon. So we'll go back to that. Let's return to something more domestic. Let's return to something a bit closer to home. And British Border Force staff have walked out today, causing disruption at airports across the UK. Members of the PCS union, including staff at Passport Control, have begun eight days of industrial action. It's part of a dispute over pay, pensions and job security. Employees have walked out at... Get a load of this. Heathrow, Gatwick, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff and Glasgow airports. They're also striking at the port of New Haven. Joining me to discuss this is travel editor of the I newspaper, it's Sophie Lamb. Goodness me, Sophie, well, we've got chaos in Paris, a different kind of chaos here, but chaos nonetheless. What's the latest with our border force going on strike? Um, so, you know, actually, it, it's quite a lot calmer than we've been expecting. Oh, um, I think with, with, with flight levels uh, now at 86% of um, pre-COVID levels over this Christmas, I think everyone was braced for some pretty chaotic scenes at the airports. But actually, things got off to a fairly smooth start. Um, we've seen the military and volunteers drafted in to help out to cover those roles of striking staff. I think there are about 1,000 staff that are striking over the next eight days. And so far, um, the, 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 the disruption has been minimal. We've we've not seen much um, disruption at all, and we've you know I've sort of seen plenty of reports of passengers coming through saying that they breeze through airports in about sort of 15, 20 minutes. Oh. Well, so, okay, so far, there you so go. good. I, I mean, this is this is fantastic news. Sorry, I've become a bit addicted to chaos in the recent days and everything, yeah. and I've just had an hour and a half of it kicking right off in Paris. So apologies for maybe over-egging the pudding somewhat there when it came to the chaos at our borders. But can I ask, what do they actually want these border? So I understand it's about, well, pay, pensions and conditions, but what is so bad currently about the pay and the pensions and the conditions? Um, so my understanding is that they've rejected the 2% pay offer and that the mandate to strike runs until May. And we've had a warning today from the PCS union that the action will ramp up significantly in January and could run, you know, into May further afield potentially if a, satisfa a satisfactory deal isn't struck for his members. So while things are kind of OK at the moment, I think we could see things getting a bit stickier in the new year. Yeah, and in terms of a real day-to-day -day impact, I mean... Normally, when strikes happen, you go, all right, well, we'll bring the army in. But we're already bringing the army and all the military in when it comes to things like the ambulance strikes and whatever's going on there. And, uh, and now we're seeing with the border force, people will be concerned when they hear the words border force. They think what's happening in the channel or national security in general. Will our national security be impacted upon? I mean, you're saying everything's all right at the minute, but maybe give it a few days. I don't know. Your, your thoughts? I mean, we, we certainly hope so. And my understanding, again, is that, that these volunteers and military personnel, you know, they, they don't go through the rigorous, rigorous training that Border Force staff do. Um, my understanding is that they were given about five days training to cover these posts. So while we're see, seeing a, quite a smooth operation going on at, at airports, you know, we don't know what exactly that training looked like. Um, you know, we hope that our borders are safe and secure and that the country has been kept protected by these these volunteers, but how sustainable these measures are remains to be seen. No, um, they've said they've rejected a 2% pay offer. Uh, if you said it, I missed it. Any idea exactly what they want? Have they released their demands yet? Is it, It's not something like 19% again, is it? Everyone seems to want about that at the moment. Um, I've, I've lost track. I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm no, not don't, honestly, fully up no, to speed with Seriously, don't, don't worry about it at all, because I haven't seen it, and I've been reporting on this all day. I just wondered if you knew. It's all right. Don't worry about it. And uh, it is so much chaos going on with the strikes at the moment, it's difficult to know exactly where everybody stands on it. But look, Sophie, thank you very much for stepping in for us on this issue. Sophie Lamb there is travel editor of the I newspaper, just filling everybody in on the latest when it comes to the border force strikes. No sign of them stopping anytime soon. They have rejected the latest offer of around 2%. Right, I've got loads coming your way. We've got the results of the GB News' People's Poll, and it finds that more people support the government's Rwanda migrant plan than oppose it. So, shock horror there, really. I'm also going to be getting some reaction to what's taking place north of the border, up in Scotland, because we had a situation, a ridiculous situation yesterday, where a bunch of elected officials decided to stand up and applaud a group of men sat in a gallery who really pushed for a bill that eroded women's rights. I mean, for example, rapists now would potentially be able to change their gender and enter women's spaces. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that is deemed to be progress. Who'd have thunk it? We'll also have the latest from Paris, where protesters have clashed with armed police. It's after a gunman shot dead three people, injured several others. We thought it was going to be a quiet day today. We were wrong about that. I'll see you in two.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeves & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. That people's pollsting is moody, isn't it? Right, OK, earlier this week, the High Court ruled that the government's plan to relocate asylum seekers to Rwanda is lawful. After legal challenges from charities and campaign groups, it was never-ending. In fact, it didn't just rule that it was lawful, it, rather hilariously, ruled that some of those charities don't have legal standing, which is fascinating. And this week, we decided to go and poll you, the nation, GB News' people, in our people's poll, and it revealed that 40%, 4-0, of the public support the government to make arrangements for relocating asylum seekers to Rwanda rather than Britain. 29% said they opposed the plans. Now, I just want to emphasise, while those numbers are on the screen there, actually, how important that is, I think a lot of people assume that when we do our people's poll, it's just targeted at GB News viewers, and it's not. It's a, well, it's a proper poll, OK? So it's 40% of the British public, as we polled them. Which is why a lot of the time, some of you decide, oh, you know, oh, gosh, you've said this amount of people supporting Brexit, or this amount of people supporting that. So 40% of the public... Now, that is significant, actually, realistically, because, actually, I think what that says is that there is, actually, a lot of support out there for the Rwanda plan and for this Rwanda deal. It's got to be part of a multi-pronged approach, and shortly I'm going to be talking to a guest on this, because what we've started to see, after years and years and years of the Tories, frankly, doing absolutely naff all about the issue, and the issue getting a lot worse, is all of a sudden the culmination of what appears to be some kind of multi-pronged approach. We've had the Rwanda plan being deemed lawful. Now, don't be fooled, this is somewhat of a smokescreen, because it could still end up being blocked, it could still pit us on a direct course of action when it comes to our European friends and judges over there. But 
Only around 200 people initially will be able to go to Rwanda, which is not a massive deterrent. Certainly when you look at the fact that it's not a deterrent for a lot of people to actually die, sadly, in the Channel. Then we've had talk early this week of a cruise ship offshore processing. Offshore processing being looked at, which I think is fascinating. And then talk as well of them ramping up the speed with which people can be processed. And it's only through a multi-pronged approach that this issue will ever get sorted. Joining me now to talk about it is the Director of the Centre of Migration and Economic Prosperity. It's Stephen Wolf. Stephen, thank you very much. Great to have you on the show. Do you actually believe that anything is going to happen with a multi-pronged approach, or do you think, yet again, we're just being led down the garden path? Actually, on this occasion, I think now that they're beginning to ramp up a little bit, I, I speak with people in the Home Office, obviously, when I'm trying to get data and understanding what their lines are. And I think there is a sense of enthusiasm and more positivity uh, from those within the camps that have been trying to work for Rwanda. You've got to understand, and I think you know this very well, that even within the civil service, there are those who want to make it work and those who are trying to prevent it from working. And those who are trying to make it work feel positive about this court decision the fact that they can ramp up sending people back to Albania and the hope that other ideas can now come forward. But, Stephen, I, I look around and I am incredibly concerned. It's another story that we covered earlier, and I'm going to draw a point of relevance here, which is that there is not, in any way, shape or form, mass public support for what happened in Scotland yesterday with the Gender Recognition Bill. There is not mass public support for the idea that women's spaces can be made in any way, shape or form less safe. And yet... A government up north who has been gripped by woke ideology decided that they had to push it forward as a matter of urgency. What we have seen now is increasing public support for the Rwanda scheme and, reading between the lines there, a more hardline approach to the Channel Migrant Crisis. I'm worried that our government down here is gripped by an equally woke political agenda and they just won't make it happen. And the civil services you alluded to. Oh, there, there is no doubt. You're in London, I've been in London. We oh. can clearly see it from law to politics to education to what's now being referred to as the blob, the civil service that are immovable in moving on the ideas of government ministers and keeping up their own ideas. So we, without a doubt, we're going to be up against those challenges. Anyone who supported Brexit knows how well they have worked for the past six years to prevent Brexit from being happening in the way that we anticipated. We know that the immigration industry has worked tremendously hard to stop Rwanda, and they're not going to give up. No. So the government has to be really strong on this, but can they? I hope so, but they've only got two years left. They have only got two years left. Stephen, I am concerned as well that we're just being lied to on the basis of, OK, what we'll use is we'll use disused university halls or we'll use disused military barracks. I mean, it actually, I must say, made me chuckle Yesterday, I saw footage of a group of uh, I saw a group of uh, very well-heeled people in Muswell Hill standing outside a hotel where a bunch of so-called asylum seekers were being taken from that hotel to a military base. I mean, they could have housed all of them in any one of the spare rooms, by the way, probably all in one of the size houses in Muswell Hill. But they were protesting about saying refugees welcome here and all of that stuff. But I, actually, I'm concerned that if we're using military barracks, we're using student halls and we're using holiday camps as well, we're still going to end up using hotels. The taxpayer just pays twice. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, refugees are welcome here as long as it's not in their homes. Yeah. I mean, I see that and hear that in Winchester when I have discussions and arguments and I ask them, how many people have you housed? Oh, well, I yeah. can't possibly do that. So that's very clear. The hypocrisy of those who support these ideas never follows through themselves. My big concern about uh, the whole r putting people in holiday camps into the military bases is the idea that we're going to swiftly move the applications through. What I have noticed in the research, I switched it off on the screen behind me, yeah. is that there's been a massive increase in those people granted asylum this year than last year. And they're doing it at the initial decision stage. So my feeling is that within the government, their view is that they can solve this in their way by actually just granting asylum to as many people as possible and reducing the numbers. That's yeah. where I feel the concern is. Well, that's what the concern is. But I, I think, as our people's poll showed there, that number of support, 40% for the government's Rwanda plan, right? And that is, that is growing and that will grow. I suspect, Stephen, that the will of the people 
will actually increase on this and will put more pressure on the government as people see that if the government caves in and gives pay rises to a variety of different public sector workers, for example, and the people keep seeing money going off to Ukraine, people keep seeing money being spent everywhere else, at some point they're going to want to say, well, hang on a minute, can we keep a little bit of that here for us and get this Rwanda plan off the ground? So, Stephen, thank you very much. Stephen Wolfe there, My who pleasure. is Director of the Centre of Migration and Economic Prosperity. And actually, he made a point there as well, didn't he, about the fact that there's a lot of people who say refugees welcome, but just not in my house. Isn't it fascinating how many people were so quick off the mark to house a Ukrainian refugee? But if you offered them someone who'd just come across the channel or someone from Syria or Afghanistan, they would say no. I would argue that's because they're actually quite secretly racist. But anyway, you're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. We will have more from Paris, where violent clashes have been panning out between protesters and police. Clashes took place after a gunman shot dead three people, injured several others in what is believed to be a racially motivated attack. I'll bring you the latest on that. There are also live images that we can hopefully show you as well as the police are in a standoff with a group of Kurdish male protesters. But first, it's your latest headlines. Patrick, thank you. I'm Bethany Elsie with your top stories from the GB newsroom. French President Emmanuel Macron has condemned what he calls a heinous attack on the Kurdish community in Paris after two men and a woman were killed in a shooting this afternoon. <laughs> Several people were also injured after a gunman opened fire on a community centre. Members of the Kurdish community have clashed with police this afternoon near to where the incident took place, expressing anger at the attack, which authorities believe could be racially motivated. A 69-year-old has been detained and police have launched an investigation into murder, manslaughter and aggravated violence. It's understood the suspect was known to police and allegedly attacked a migrant camp last year. The health secretary has called a newly announced strikes by nurses on the 18th and 19th of January disappointing and says they're in no one's best interests. The Royal College of Nursing says the walkouts will go ahead unless the government opens negotiations over pay. Meanwhile, the GMB's called off a post-Christmas strike by ambulance workers in England and Wales. They'll now walk out on the 11th of January. The union's national secretary, Rachel Harrison, thanked the public for their support. The Prime Minister's apologised for Christmas travel disruption following strike action by Border Force staff today. What do we want? Ten percent. When do we want it? No. Heathrow, Gatwick, Birmingham, Cardiff, Glasgow and Manchester airports are all affected, but Heathrow claims it's operating as normal. Military personnel and volunteers from the civil service have been trained to step in. Rishi Sunak insists public sector pay must be controlled to keep down inflation. First of all, I'm, I'm really sad and I'm disappointed about the disruption that is being caused to so many people's lives, particularly at Christmas time. What I'm trying to do is make the right long-term decisions for the country, for everybody's benefit. And I think we all know that the, the major economic challenge we all face now is inflation. It's inflation that's eating into everyone's pay packets, it's you know, rising the cost of living. And I want to make sure that we reduce inflation. Part of that is being responsible when it comes to setting public sector pay. And George Cohen, who was part of England's 1966 World Cup winning team, has died at the age of 83. Cohen played every minute of the victorious campaign on home soil and in total won 37 caps for his country. His former club, Fulham, announced his death this morning. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Don't go anywhere. Patrick will be back in just a moment. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 
seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Monday to th in GB News. At six, it's Deeves and Co. Seven o'clock, Farage. At eight, join Mark Stein. And at nine, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch-up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB+. Plus. Not 20 minutes here because we've got loads to fit in. Join the show today, we've brought you live pictures of the protest scenes in Paris. Protest riots, really, wasn't it? Where the discontent was rising following a shooting there earlier today, a mass shooting. Three people died, at least four injured, two critically. 69-year-old man arrested. He's believed to have a previous conviction for a racially aggravated attack. It's been reported that the Kurdish demonstrators who were clashing with police were doing so to demand justice after that deadly shooting. Three people died. They said the police had not done enough to protect them. And those clashes, which you're seeing pictures of, or just saw pictures of anyway, got particularly violent. I'm joined now by Charles-Henri Galois, who is political commentator and leader of France's Generation Frexit group. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, look, the protesters there are initially saying that not enough was being done to protect them from a racist attack. Your views? Hi, Patrick. Let's first, we, we don't know really uh, what's the motivation of, of the guy uh, who did it. We know that he has like some racist attack uh, background. But we don't know if uh, he's a, uh, let's say, old French citizen or is he linked to the Turkish, as you know, that there are all the, the protests between the Turkish and the Kurdish. So we don't have uh, the background uh, behind that to, 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 to say something. What we can say, it's uh, always the same. Uh, it's uh, the judicial laxity, because this yeah. guy has uh, two uh, previous killing uh, attempts. And still, he was freed. Actually, he has been freed uh, by uh, December 12th. So this is the main issue uh, mm. about, uh, about, I think, this, this drama. Yeah, about security. And what's important to mention as well is a lot of people are saying online that this is a far-right terror attack. This is yet to be confirmed and one thing that we had earlier on our security editor Mark White was saying that there was concern amongst the Kurdish community that this was a dispute between Turkish people and Kurdish people we'll have to wait and see exactly how this pans out but important not to jump to conclusions there but one thing what did you make of the reaction from the local Kurdish population there we witnessed some pretty terrifying scenes riots with the French police I mean, it's quite disturbing because uh, the, the French police has uh, acted quite quickly. Actually, they were they were there 
just after the shooting, they have uh, immobilized uh, the, the, the killer. Everything was quite weak and well managed. Then I don't know what could happen during the, the process to have that kind of uh, riots. Because, I, I mean, the, the enemy is the, the guy who did it. As you said, we don't know if it's mm. far, far right activist, if he's linked to to the Turkish at that point, uh, we don't know. But let's say it's not the, the French police uh, that uh, committed this murder. So it's, it's quite disturbing to see that kind of riot. And let me say something, if it's linked uh, to uh, Turkish, it, it, um, mm. it is also the issue of uh, uh, mass migration because when you have mass migration, you, you tend to bring all the conflicts, international yeah. conflicts at home because you will have the conflict beto- between uh, uh, Israel and Palestine, you will have the conflict between uh, Kurdish and Turkey, you will have all the conflict on the world in your home. So that may be a problem as well, even is, as, as, as we say, we don't know so far the, 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 the profile of, of, of the guy. Charles, what are race relations like in Paris and in France at the moment? No, I mean, normally, normally it's OK. The main issue uh, th- that we have, it's, uh, it's an issue of number. It's, uh, it's mass migration because uh, quite the same in the UK. You have uh, like uh, 300,000 people that come every year. And that is the issue because you can assimilate, you can integrate a few people, but you cannot integrate whole countries. You integrate individuals. And what happens if, if when you have this kind of numbers, you don't have the assimilation and you have some issue and you, you have, let's say, uh, every every day you have some problem, uh, whether it's with uh, Aslim uh, secure people and uh, in terms of uh, sec- security, in terms of assimilation, it, it's a complete disaster. It cannot work, actually. I mean, we, we should uh, reduce uh, the immigration flows. Uh, the issue that we have, it's uh, unlike... Uh, uh, the UK, we are in the EU, and you know, in the EU, the legal migration, mm. let's say, is handled by the EU on illegal immigration. Once you are in the Schengen area, you cannot fight against it. So you you, you will have this issue. But let's say on a global picture, main people are integrated, but you have some numbers uh, that cannot work. And if you have that kind of numbers, mm. it cannot work. So we, we have All big right, work on, on that to, to do. Charles, thank you very much. Charles Henri Gaulois there, the political commentator and leader of France's Generation Frexit group, reacting to the latest from Paris. A standoff continues between uh, the Kurdish population, or an element of the Kurdish population, anyway, in the 10th arrondissement of Paris, and uh, riot police after three people were shot dead, four injured, two critically still injured, and a 69-year-old man is in police custody. That is believed to have then prompted riots in Paris, which we brought to you live here. But I'm going to move on now because the Prime Minister has said... This is a massive story, by the way, absolutely massive. The Prime Minister has said that it would be responsible... Reasonable, sorry, reasonable, for the UK government to consider blocking new gender reforms in Scotland. So, this is an intense week of debate over the Gender Recognition Reform Bill in Holyrood, which has now been passed. It's intended to make it easier for trans Scots to obtain a gender recognition certificate. Westminster might be able to block it, though. Nicola Sturgeon, no doubt, would kick right off, although the problem with that is, is this the hill that she wants to die on? The bill, yes, does make it easier, just on paper, for trans men to say that they are now women, they can get their birth certificate changed, but serious concerns over the fact that it lowers the age that people are able to do this from, down to 16, 15 and a half years old in some cases, without a doctor's note, having just lived in that as your gender, as your gender. What does that even mean? Changing your pronouns on Twitter? For a matter of months. And it also means, and this for me was the utterly, utterly sickening bit, the SNP, the Labour Party, the Greens and the Lib Dems had a choice up there whether or not to include, or to exclude, sorry, people who were wanted for rape or sexual or violent crimes against women from being able to change their gender and therefore enter women's spaces. And they decided to not exclude them from that. Why? Absolute madness. Here for me to talk about this now is the leader of the Alba Party in Westminster, Neil Hanvey, MP, and Conservative Councillor for Falkirk North, it's James Bundy. Look, 
the absolute utter lunacy of this policy, as far as I'm concerned, knows no bounds. But I just want to talk to you a little bit about whether or not Westminster decides to overrule this and what that would really mean. I'm going to start with Neil. I'll start with you, who is the leader of the Albert Party in Westminster, Neil Hamby, MP. Your views, if Westminster decides to overrule what's gone on in Holyrood? Well, I mean, I'm very happy to have stood alongside um, MPs and MSPs from the SNP who opposed this legislation uh, and who were, um, you know, fighting for the amendments that would have um, limited uh, the impact of this on uh, women and other vulnerable groups. Um, so, you know, that's my starting point. Now, whether um, it's right for Westminster to interfere in Scots law is a, a very different argument. And as a matter of principle, I think that's wrong. What Mm. needs to happen is that um, this law should be amended uh, in the Scottish Parliament by the Scottish Parliament uh, and they should take cognizance of um, the impact on the rest of the UK uh, when they were when they were considering the bill I mean it, it yeah. shouldn't have passed in its current well law. no look it, it shouldn't it shouldn't have uh, and, and I get that but the fact is it has and Nicola Sturgeon is in charge there and banging the drum and I'm just going to bring you in now James James Bundy is Conservative councillor for Falkirk North is this a hill that Nicola Sturgeon really wants to die on is she going to try to use potentially Westminster blocking this as a way of drumming up support, even more support for Scottish independence, because I suspect, James, if she picks this topic, the public won't be with her. I don't think the vast majority of the public support this. No, the opinion polls show that the vast majority of Scots are not in favour of this legislation. Um, even the majority of SNP voters aren't in favour of it. So when it comes to taking the UK government to court, it's not a very sensible... Mm. Um, idea, um, but the Supreme Court case um, that we just had on independence wasn't um, wise either. That was £250,000 of taxpayers' money down the drain. Um, but the, the actual part of this um, bill, um, as you said in your introduction, um, Patrick, was um, sex offenders, rapists, yeah. those who have been charged with domestic abuse, they are permitted to change the gender with three months um, of living in the other gender, whatever that means. Yeah. And these were the Conservatives, as well as some backbench SNP rebels, put forward sensible, common sense amendments. And the SNP, majority of the SNP, Nicola Sturgeon and our top team and the Greens forced them through. Uh, it was mm. sickening, even though I still expected the votes to go through just because of the parliamentary arithmetic. It was mm. sickening. Yeah. And when it actually was confirmed. And I was at the protest on um, Wednesday outside the Parliament, uh, listening to the speakers, and yourself included now, and it was, the numbers there were really passionate, and they, they just felt that their voices were being ignored. Yeah, and, and, it's, it, it, and it's on that. I'm just, I'm just going to cut you off, because I want to go back to you both quickly, and I'm a bit pressed for time, given the events that took place in Paris. It's kind of ripped our running order a little bit up here. But, uh, Neil, I'll go back to you. Your message to Nicola Sturgeon on this would be what? Well, I mean, the, the message to Nicola Sturgeon is that she has misused support for independence to fight this pe this petty cause of hers, and she has been ruthless in ignoring dissenting voices within the independence movement. This won't strengthen uh, the cause of independence, mm -hmm. and this has been a distraction, a divisive distraction. I can't understand what she's thinking about because there is not the support for this legislation, and certainly not in its current form, Okay. in the, the Scottish public. Um, okay. I, I, it's just nonsensical. All right. James, has Nicola Sturgeon endangered women in Scotland now? Um, yes, um, that is the reality of this bill. Um, it's not anti-trans to say that mm. um, sex not offenders and rapists will take advantage of this bill. If she accepted the common sense amendments, it's a totally different story. But her and the Greens pushed it through. Look, both of you, thank you very much. I'm sorry we didn't have a bit longer, chaps. I'm sure you've been sat on the line for a while, but that's the nature of the beast, I'm afraid. That's Neil Hamby there, MP, who's leader of the Albert Party in Westminster, and Conservative Councillor for Falkirk North, James Bundy, wishing you through the utter madness that's taking place north of the border. Right, time for just one more quick one, because this week's GB News People's Poll, you love to see it, has revealed that 22% of the public believe that Keir Starmer would be able to manage the strikes better than Rishi Sunak. Only 14% of the voters chose Rishi Sunak, whereas a whopping 40% of them 
said that neither of them would be able to handle it better. But would Labour actually be able to combat the strikes effectively? Here to pick the bones out of this one <laughs> is former Labour MP Stephen Pound. Stephen, thank you very much. People get what the Tories are doing now because they're not really going to negotiate, so at least we know where they stand. Labour, they're on a sticky wicket. Would they do any better at the minute? Absolutely, no question. Look, what we'd do for, to start with, we'd have a little bit of consistency. Because at the present Which is time... Which what, consistently do nothing? And, oh, God, God, you're sharp. Yeah, <laughs> no, what, what we talk, what, you should be writing those Christmas crackers, shouldn't you? But no, what, what, at the present time, you've got... The government is facing two ways. You've got Stephen Barclay and Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak trying to pretend he's you know, the tough guy. In, in reality, we all know he couldn't knock yeah. his skin off yeah. a rice pudding, but you know, he's, he's trying to become Mr Tough Guy. On the one hand, they're saying, you know, you're going to put people's lives at risk. They're making comments from the sideline which are most unhelpful. But on the other hand, they're saying we're not going to talk to you. Now, look, collective bargaining, the clue is in the name, bargaining. And it's no use saying 19% is the be-all and end-all, because the reality is we've got to get them around the table, we've got to talk. Because don't forget, Patrick, mm. the government is actually the employer. In nearly all of these cases, it's the government that foots the bill. They have a bounden duty to the nation to get involved and to stand on the sidelines sniping and making these stupid, aggressive comments does, does no one any At what point do you think Keir Starmer has a duty to the people in the unions to say, look, if we're being offered things like they've been offered up north, a 7.5% pay rise for nurses up there, that's rejected. At what point do you think people will see Keir Starmer coming out and actually speaking against the unions? Or is he too scared? Well, no, I mean, don't forget, you know, most of the unions there aren't affiliated to the Labour Party anyway. No. Right? The RMT stands candidates against the Labour Party. Look, I mean, I, 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 I used to be a negotiator... Communists um, in, is in, what I was about to say. The, well, <laughs> I, I, th those are the respectable ones. <laughs> yeah. Look, the reality is, as soon as you, you broke up British Rail into all these little components, as soon as you broke up the NHS into all these competing groups, that was Christmas come early for collective bargainers. And because what you used to have was national bargaining. You had the Whitley Council and the Health Service, and so you did one deal with all the unions, and inevitably mm. there was a compromise. Now you've got all these individual unions, uh, and each one of them is making their own case. If I was a negotiator nowadays, mm. I'd be rubbing my hands with glee, because I knew that you know, I could actually make a local agreement instead of the old days when it had to be national. So in the long term, mm. I mean, I think we're going to hear more of this bring the railways back, bring public utilities back into public ownership, comrade. Oh, whoa, <laughs> there you go. I tell you what, it's strong stuff. I mean, I completely disagree with you. But would Labour actually want to be in power right now? I mean, they're, they're inheriting a bit of a mess, aren't they, really? And yeah. don't just pin all this on the Tories. Let's look forward and go, would Labour actually want to inherit this right now? Well, I think so. I mean, one of the things that they told me when I first got elected to Parliament, mm -hmm. it's your country first, your constituency second, your party third. Right. You know, that may sound a bit pompous, but in reality, that's what it's about. When you're elected as a member of Parliament, you're represented mm -hmm. as a member of the UK Parliament, it's got to be country first and party third. Some would say the monarchy's a big part of the country, though, and Keir Starmer used to want to abolish that. I don't, he doesn't want to abolish the monarchy, he wants to abolish the House of Lords, which is, you know, mm. basically the wingman of the, of the uh, establishment. Mm. I, don't, I don't think he, he's... He used to. He used to want to. Oh, sorry. I think yeah. he's changed. Because this is the concern with... What, what, what uh, were you Kevin, like when you were 19? <laughs> well, you don't want to know. <laughs> Criminal. No, but um, you, you, this is the concern with, with, with Keir Starmer, which is that is he just masking the idea that he is actually a lot further left than he is. I mean, he used to stand side by side with Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. And people, you know, it looks like they're voting for, you know, some fluffy, nice solicitor. And actually what they're going to get is... Well, no, hang, hang on a second. Big red yeah. care. We, we, have a th we have a thing called collective responsibility. I was on the front bench under Corbyn. I didn't right. vote for Corbyn. You know, Jeremy knows where I stand with him. I've known, you know, I've okay. known him, you know, since we were both 21 years old. Uh, but if you're in the shadow cabinet and if you're a member okay. of the front bench, you've got collective responsibility. Okay. I may not like the captain of the team, but it's still my team. Stephen Pound. Thank you very, very much. Sorry to rush you, but there we go. That is former Labour MP Stephen Pound as to whether or not people think that Keir Starmer would do a better job of handling these strikes. 40% of you, the great British public, think neither Starmer or Sunak would do a good job. Thank you very much, everybody. I've been Patrick Christie. See you in a bit. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before.
So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week.